Good morning. My name is Alan Weil. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're very pleased to be releasing the March issue, March 2018 issue of Health Affairs, uh, Advancing Health Equity. Uh, back in June of 2017, we had uh, an issue pursuing health equity that covered um, a lot of ground on the topic, but uh, left many issues unaddressed, and we were very pleased to be able to do a second thematic issue focusing on the issue of health equity. Uh, for those of you who've been following the topic, you know, of course, that there's a long history of documenting what were early on called disparities in healthcare, uh, particularly around outcomes and access. Uh, the term equity encompasses a sense of uh, evaluation in addition to just documenting differences, it suggests and accurately suggests that inequities, disparities, uh, have negative consequences for a significant number of people and that those disparities should be addressed. Much of the early work was on documenting the nature of those differences. Um, both the June 2017 issue and the issue today are our efforts to push the scholarship forward to uh, some additional documentation, but more focusing on solutions, approaches, frameworks, specific policy interventions, all designed to try to tackle this issue. And that's what we bring together as we release uh, the issue today. It takes a lot of work to put together a thematic issue. We're grateful to Paula Braveman at the UCSF School of Medicine, Joe Betancourt at the Harvard Medical School. They served as our theme advisors on this issue. And uh, financial support came from a consortium of foundations, uh, the Kresge Foundation, the California Endowment, the Colorado Health Foundation, the Episcopal Health Foundation, the Aetna Foundation, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, all of uh, whom provided the support necessary to put the issue together as well as hold this briefing today. We've organized the data to show the extension of knowledge that uh, occurs in this issue. We begin with a series of papers that look at frameworks or approaches, sort of ways people are attempting to bring the equity uh, issues into policy discussions. Uh, we then move to a segment of a number of papers that look at the topic of income, which is uh, very much uh, tied to people's health. After a break, uh, there are three papers that look at dimensions of disparities that have not been as fully analyzed in the past, and so it's uh, our contribution as well to uh, expanding the knowledge base. And then our closing panel will focus on interventions uh, designed to reduce disparities, some of which have shown some quite promising results. Now, that's our uh, plan for the day. We will, um, uh, I'll introduce our panelists. They'll each present uh, the core findings from their papers. I'll ask a few questions and then we'll turn to the audience. That'll be our, the way we run the day. Uh, I should note as we begin that this issue also has uh, in it, as I move a few slides forward, uh, we have a, a data graphic which is gonna come up in a moment, hopefully. They were just testing it so I know it works. But let's, uh, let's see if we can get our slides to move forward. Here we come. Uh, in the front of the issue is uh, a data graphic which draws findings from a number of the papers in the journal. Better it be slow for me than for the authors. There we go. Uh, this draws out some of the findings from a number of the papers uh, on a single page. We're pleased to be able to include this in a growing number of our uh, of our uh, thematic issues. So I'll move now to our first panel, which is going to describe uh, various approaches taken to uh, bringing equity into the policy conversation. Uh, you'll hear from Rich Hall, professor in the Department of Political Science and the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Uh, Marsha Regenstein, professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health and director of the DRPH program there. Uh, Andrew Anderson, senior director of quality measurement at the National Quality Forum who leads NQF's work on social determinants of health, shared decision making, and uh, health disparities. And May Lin, a PhD candidate uh, in sociology at the University of Southern California. So I'll turn it over first 
Too rich. Go. The study I'll discuss today is a joint project with Peter Jacobson, who's a colleague in the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Our study examines the role that the health and all policies approach plays in promoting health equity as a policy objective at the state and local level. Health and all policies, or HIAP, is an increasingly common term in the health policy community. Uh, it does not refer to a specific set of policies per, met, per se, so much as a, an approach or process for incorporating health objectives into collaborative work with officials in non-health agencies. It rests on two premises. Um, first, the most important determinants of health are social, economic, and environmental, and second, that the policies affecting them typically fall outside the jurisdiction of most health departments. Policies governed by housing, transportation, criminal justice, human services, and many others have direct but often underappreciated uh, uh, effects on the health of individuals and communities. Now, the proximate goal of HIAP is to break down institutional barriers so that health policy officials can get a seat at the table when other departments are making decisions that have or might have health consequences. Now, because the social determinants of health are marked by large uh, racial, ethnic, income, and other disparities, the HIAP approach should, in principle, work to promote health equity. Indeed, many, although not all, academic definitions consider health equity a defining purpose uh, of the approach. Our question in this study is empirical rather than definitional. Uh, does it do that in practice? More specifically, uh, do HIAP initiatives elevate health equity as a, priori <clears throat> as a priority in policy discussions with officials in, who do not normally focus on health, uh, much less health equity? Um, now, the, the data, sorry, the data for our study come from 65 in-depth interviews with U.S. state and local officials conducted across 19 sites in five states. Three themes emerge from these interviews. First, respondents report that HIAP does, does provide a useful framework for promoting health equity. For example, a public health official in Colorado commented, we're not interested in partnering just for the sake of partnering, but we're interested in partnering to improve outcomes for our most vulnerable and marginalized communities in Colorado. As we will discuss, or as I, I will make clear momentarily, however, the value of the framework for promoting health equity, while positive, varies in degree. Second, the HIAP uh, uh, equity connection tends to be issue dependent. It emerges through collaborations focused on specific cross-jurisdictional issues. For example, one local governmental official in Maryland stated, as a matter of fact, that a HIAP-based housing initiative, including weatherization, lead paint removal, and roof repairs, is inherently an equity-oriented program. To take another example, the state of Massachusetts has institutionalized a HIAP initiative for one sector called the Healthy Transportation Compact. Third, HIAP's utility in promoting health equity is politically contingent. Respondents emphasize that using the HIAP approach to promote health equity in a politically conservative area is more difficult. One staff member of a Colorado nonprofit observed, we're a purple state. The Denver metro area is very different than the rest of the state. So we have a lot of counties where you add any additional policies with health language about equity, that's a def definite overreach. In California and Massachusetts, in contrast, the political environment at the state level makes it easier to uh, tie cross-sectoral initiatives uh, to reducing social disparities in health. But even in these states, there is considerable variation at the local level. Now, the study has several policy implications, and I'm not going to uh, be able to get to all of them, I don't think. But first, um, to practitioners, don't wait on an institutional mandate. Health policy entrepreneurs should seek opportunities to collaborate with non-health agencies around specific issues and build, build from there. Now, to be sure, the HIAP ideal is to create um, collaboration at a high level of institutional integration. California led the way in using the HIAP framework and by creating a HIAP task force. It has proven remarkably successful in promoting health equity. Um, 
But that's not the only model. Our interviews in other states and localities suggest that the institutionalization of HIAP is not a necessary condition for its effectiveness in promoting health equity. We uncovered multiple examples of cross-sectoral working groups focused on social disparities in health, sustained over long periods without any mandate or even a name. What holds such groups together is not an institution, but a social network sustained by overlapping generations of participants. To provide one illustration at the, of this point, uh, Boston created a HIAP task force in 2013, but it dropped out of sight without any record of its activities or even a membership list that we could find. Now in January of this year, they resuscitated the, the task force, but as we described in the article, um, in the interim period, HIAP initiatives focusing on health equity remind, remained alive and well in Boston in the form of issue-specific bilateral collaborations. Second, uh, look to foundations, a second implication, look to foundations and state and federal programs uh, that promote health equity for resources to subsidize cross-sector collaborations. For example, several sites in our sample receive CDC REACH grants racial and ethnic approaches to community health, which subsidized their HIAP initiatives. Third, in contentious political environments, pursue health equity um, as a byproduct of policies framed in other terms. At a few sites, the respondents observed that in conservative communities, it's better to make the economic case for healthy living initiatives that attract people and businesses to the community. But because these uh, initiatives address the social determinants of health, which are marked by different disparities. Improvements in health equity can be promoted as uh, an important, if less explicit, byproduct of this strategy. Good morning, everyone. Hi, today I'm going to talk about addressing social determinants of health through medical legal partnerships. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Jennifer Trott, Alana Williamson, and Joanna Tice. Um, healthcare systems are increasingly recognizing that they just can't do it all by themselves. They can't, they need to create partnerships beyond the four walls to bring health to their patients. Even the best clinical care can only go so far. I'm in denial about my height. <laughs> uh, they can only go so far if patients lack safe housing or have problems getting adequate food or have been wrongly denied benefits. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk today about our article uh, and our intervention, an intervention we talk about, something called a medical legal partnership, which brings a new discipline, a new group of professionals into a healthcare system specifically to improve the lives of low income and otherwise vulnerable patients. So what is an MLP? And I refer to it as an MLP, a medical legal partnership. Medical legal partnerships have been around for a while. They started in children's hospitals in the early 90s with pediatricians among the early adopters who saw how poor housing, educational barriers, and other social determinants could affect the healthy development of children. MLPs have since spread to different healthcare organizations in lots and lots of different populations. In our health affairs article, we identify the eight core elements of a medical legal partnership, which I will, and I'll highlight just a few of those today. First, MLPs begin with a formal agreement between key partners. Those key partners are a healthcare organization and a civil legal aid nonprofit, generally a legal aid organization or a law school, lawyers and paralegals partnering with clinicians and healthcare staff. Next, the partnership identifies a population as the focus of the intervention. For example, a health system might decide to locate an MLP in a clinic with a high needs population, low income families, chronically ill kids, 
or make MLP services available to a group with high civil legal needs. For example, veterans with mental health issues, trans persons who need document changes, persons with HIV who face issues with disability benefits. And then perhaps the most visible part of the MLP is the something we call, quote unquote, sort of the lawyer in residence. Most partnerships station lawyers at the healthcare site to accomplish at least three things. First, to serve as a resource for the clinicians and the staff there who have questions about how they can best help the pa their patients with non-clinical issues. They also provide, though, uh, direct legal intervention at the site, and that site is really better suited and better integrated with the client's everyday lives. So lawyers like to see patients at a healthcare site because that's where patients are. And third, they're there to train clinicians at, and staff at the healthcare site about civil legal resources and when a lawyer really makes sense and can be most helpful. In our paper, we provide examples of 10 MLPs that focus on different patient populations and different service arrangements. I'll mention just uh, three today. The typical MLP is one very much like the one at Cincinnati Children's, which is an outstanding example of a general population MLP that stations lawyers at an on-site primary care clinic with a high number of patients on Medicaid. All pediatric residents at Cincinnati Children's rotate through the clinic where they receive training on uh, social determinants of health and ways to intervene on ch for children on behalf, uh, on behalf of their patients, including a referral to a lawyer. In 2016, clinic staff referred about 825 patients to the lawyers, which represents about 3% of all the patients seen at the site. Most commonly, they're referred for issues related to housing, public benefits, and education issues. In Delaware, the Public Health Department has added an MLP to its program for pregnant and postpartum women at, the, at risk of poor health outcomes. That's an example of an MLP that targets a specific patient population. And some partnerships use legal resources in alternative models. I'm so happy to see some of the lawyers from Whitman Walker Health here in the audience. Whitman Walker Health is an FQHC that fully incorporates legal services into the fabric of its healthcare enterprise. About 10% of all patients at Whitman Walker Health receive help from a lawyer, primarily related to public benefits and transgender identity legal documentation changes. The health center employs 11 of its own full-time lawyers and paralegals to make sure patients can fully access benefits and services that can support their health and well-being. Health systems that bring lawyers to the bedside or see firsthand the ways that intentional planning to address social determinants of health can transform people's lives. MLP really works best when it's aligned with a health system's full menu of interventions to address social determinants and advance equity among its community. Having civil lawyers on board as part of the healthcare team creates new capacity to help patients where they live. That's not just a metaphor. It literally helps them with where they live. And it also results in upstream advantages. When pa patterns of benefit denials, housing violations, or administrative barriers become apparent and are resolved before they create problems for patients and others in the community. These partnerships required support, time and money, but the lion's share of that support has been coming from the nonprofit legal services community, which unfortunately is not funded to sustain and spread the intervent intervention. The Health Resources and Services Administration is extremely supportive of MLP as an equity intervention and includes legal stat services among its list of federally approved enabling services. Several states are experimenting with Medicaid pilots to provide legal services for high-risk patients, and a number of large health systems are also looking at these partnerships to, as an enhancement to care management for some of their enrollees. What we really hope to see as MLPs continue to grow and spread is more research on what works best for patients, clinics, and health systems alike.
Uh, hi, well, good morning. Um, I guess first I want to say I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I really hope that this paper will add to the conversation about how we can leverage payment policies as well as performance measurement for reducing disparities and promoting health equity. I want to first thank my co-authors, Aaron O'Rourke at the National Quality Forum, Marshall Chin at the University of Chicago, Nunez Ponce at UCLA, um, Susanna Bernheim at Yale Corps, as well as Helen Burstyn at the Council on, Medi Council on Medical Specialty Societies. So this paper really came out of work um, from a multi-stakeholder committee that was convened by the National Quality Forum, as well as supported by the Department of Health and Human Services. And they were asked, how do we move the healthcare system from where we are now to a point where we can achieve this goal of equity? Um, and so this, when I say multi-stakeholder, I mean it was a committee of physicians, um, nurses, patient advocates, um, health plan leaders. And the roadmap, the paper descri describes this roadmap um, into four action areas. So the four action areas are one, to identify and prioritize reducing disparities um, and really making a commitment to reducing disparities, healthcare organizations in particular and investing or implementing evidence-based interventions, as well as investing in the development of health equity measures, which I'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. And then finally, um, to actually incentivize the reduction of disparities through accountability and transparency. And so the, we took, in this paper, we took the roadmap and we applied it to the specific issue of hypertension or disparities in hypertension in African-American communities. Um, to do this work, we conducted an environmental scan of existing measures as well as a uh, lit literature review of um, not only interventions that can reduce disparities in hypertension, but also um, the current state of disparities. And then we also conducted key informant interviews with uh, experts in cardiovascular disease care and um, healthcare disparities. So I'll just take a couple moments to go through some of the key takeaways from the paper. Um, so we know that hypertension is highly prevalent among African Americans, and the disparities are longstanding. The American Heart Association um, estimates that hypertension among African Americans, it's about 40% um, is the prevalence rate. Um, they, African American men and women have high blood pressure and hypertension at, at that rate. Um, <clears throat> And then the size of the disparity is sizable. So there is about a 10%, according to the National Center for Health Statistics, there is about a 10% um, difference between African Americans, the prevalence of hypertension among African Americans and non-Hispanic whites. And then we also have a pretty strong evidence base relatively um, on the strategies that are used to reduce disparities in these communities. And then finally, we also have um, several leading health systems in the private and the public sector that have been successful in reducing disparities among African Americans with hypertension. Um, and I'll just, so despite the evidence and um, you know, despite these role models, there has been limited uptake and a lot of these strategies are being implemented in silos. And one message from this paper is that performance measurement can be used to increase the uptake of these strategies. And I'll just talk a little bit about some of the strategies here um, um, that we found in the literature. So community partnerships that focus on changing behavior and lifestyle um, uh, programs, self-management programs that target diet, exercise, and stress, um, reorganizing care um, through multidisciplinary teams to actually come up with tailored treatment plans for African Americans with hypertension, and peer coaches and community health workers that exercise cultural humility um, in coordinating care in a way that reduces barriers. And so we know that these are some of the strategies that it, um, exist, but we also need measures to assess whether or not these are being implemented. So some measures that we could use are, you know, whether or not African Americans are connected with hypertension are connected to um, resources in their communities, such as healthy housing, um, uh, safe housing, healthy foods, um, safe places to exercise. Um, we also need measures that can assess these team-based care with a, a tailored treatment plan, and measures that can assess whether or not individuals with hypertension can actually um, afford necessary medications to manage their conditions. And then finally, um, with community benefit dollars, we can do, um, healthcare organizations conduct, can conduct outreach in their communities, uh, looking at, you know, prevention education, blood pressure screening, and particular um, hypertension reduction projects in communities. 
So with all of that, um, one of the, <clears throat> the main questions that looms is, you know, how do we get this to happen? You know, how do we get, increase the uptake? So it's about tying incentives to these redu reduction, disparities reduction activities. And so the shift to value-based care really creates this um, unique opportunity to do some of this type of work, this type of work. And we are starting to see the healthcare system move, um, move towards this direction. For example, MIPS um, at CMS or the merit-based um, incentive payment system recently included um, equity as a pra practice improvement activity. We can also use things like global and capitated and bundled payments to support the infrastructure for um, reducing disparities um, in African Americans with hypertension. Um, hospitals um, can use, as I mentioned, their community benefit dollars to pursue long-term changes such as policy um, changes, system changes, and health plans can increase payments for primary and preventative care because many of the interventions that we found were implemented in ambulato ambulatory care settings. And then finally, we can also adjust performance measures. So this is a pretty um, um, hot topic right now, is like adjusting performance measures for social risk. So essentially, we, are, we would want to make sure that um, providers that are disproportionately serving individuals with social risk are actually um, getting the resources that they need or being able to compete fairly in value-based purchasing programs. So ultimately, and in summary, um, we need measures that can assess whether or not disparities are ex exist and monitor them routinely in clinical care. And then we also need to be building health equity into emerging care models, such as accountable care organizations and patient-centered medical homes, um, as well as value-based payment programs. And then finally, we need to be weaving equity into the, the fabric of quality improvement, otherwise it will continue to elude us and I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the folks at Health Affairs for the invitation to speak and to contribute to this special issue. I um, wanted to know that I'm presenting here on behalf of my co-authors as well, Manuel Pastor and Veronica Turiquez. So public health scholarship has increasingly recognized the role of community organizing in advancing health equity. Grassroots community organizing efforts tackle socioeconomic inequities at the root of health disparities by developing the leadership of impacted communities to drive policy and other forms of change. So our paper in this uh, issue reverses the focus on the relationship between community organizing and health equity. We look at health equity as a social movement frame that can help improve the effectiveness of community organizing efforts around a wide array of issues of inequality and inequity, not just those that seem directly pertinent to health. So frames are interpretive frameworks that social movements use to garner legitimacy and advance policy agendas. So for example, civil rights is a well-known social movements framework that appeals to values of equal opportunity and justice. So we find that the health equity frame is being used in three main ways in social movements in California specifically. So one, health equity frames help move the needle on health concerns, especially unequal outcomes across groups. Two, health equity frames lend weight to issues around social determinants of health, such as affordable housing and school discipline policies. Three, health equity frames encourage health promotion practices within community organizing groups. And so we draw from data from multiple studies that my co-authors and I conducted, um, including surveys, participant observation, semi-structured interviews from 2010 to the present, again, in California. So our paper discusses more examples, but I'll just highlight a few here. So first, we find that health equity as a frame calls attention to health needs of disadvantaged groups. Um, we find that health equity can be a more widely accepted frame than direct calls for immigrant rights or racial justice, which have been notoriously difficult to mobilize po uh, policy change around. So for example, the Health for All campaign in California responded to the denial of federally supported health care coverage to undocumented immigrants in the Affordable Care Act. Groups across the state mobilized to address this gap and to extend state-financed health insurance to undocumented communities via lobbying, public hearings, rallies, and other forms of direct action and organizing. 
So notably, the Health for All frame focused not necessarily on immigrant rights, but on healthcare as a human right. So for example, on the California Endowments website, a health foundation and um, a supporter of this campaign, quote, healthcare is a human right and providing health coverage to everyone, regardless of immigration status, is the right thing to do. Join us in fighting for health for all because a healthcare system that excludes anyone hurts everyone, end quote. So um, there were some local fights around this, but some of the statewide uh, organizing efforts resulted in policy changes such as SB4, signed by Governor Jerry Brown in 2015, which allowed all low-income undocumented children to enroll in full-scope Medi-Cal, uh, California's Medicaid program. So secondly, we find that health equity is a connective frame that offers a new way for grassroots organizing groups to explain and address social injustices with less easily understood connections to health per se. So for example, educational justice groups have long been working on punitive school discipline policies that have disproportionately suspended and expelled students of color, especially young men of color. Um, such policies are often referred to as a school to prison pipeline um, because being suspended or expelled from high school predicts a criminal record in young adulthood. So groups have made important strides in advance uh, in progress addressing these issues over the years, but health equity frames recently became a useful tool um, so organizers and advocates have borrowed from the legitimacy established from the scholarship on social determinants of health. For example, they stress how behaviors in school that are traditionally addressed with punishment result from trauma and stresses from systemic inequalities, such as chronic poverty and racism. They have also pointed out, or also drawn from health equity frames, to propose solutions. For example, um, replacing punitive policies with trauma-informed learning or restorative justice, which are policies which seek to support students' emotional, mental, and physical health. So for example, restorative justice proposes non-punitive approaches such as mediated conversations between students who caused harm and the person harmed. Third, we highlight how health equity frames shape internal organizational practices. Um, so for me, I, I've been involved in community organizing um, for a while, and I would say even in the past 10 years, or even five years ago, um, social movements traditionally looked at individual well-being as a luxury or something that you may even sacrifice for the greater good by participating in social change. And so community organizers have increasingly noticed that even though participating in social movements can bring individual and community benefits to health, it can also lead to burnout, to stress, and to exhaustion. Um, so leaders in the movement for black lives, for example, have been very vocal in pointing out that participating in social movements can um, negatively impact physical and mental health in ways um, for groups that already experience poor risk, risk of poor health outcomes, even though um, strangely enough, participating in social movements can lead to policy changes that are also beneficial for these communities. So grassroots organizing groups draw from health equity to ensure the well-being of staff and members. So for example, Fathers and Families of San Joaquin in Stockton, California, employs what they call healing-centered community organizing to address communities' high poverty and incarceration rates. So they define healing-centered organizing as, quote, an emerging practice that places individual and collective emotional and spiritual well-being at the center of social justice efforts, end quote. And so in my own work with um, youth groups, I've seen how groups have increasingly adopted uh, indigenous cultural practices around healing or talking circles to share emotions in response to stressful situations. So for example, I um, observed one in response to the Parkland shootings. Um, so uh, as, as another example, Los Angeles-based Dignity and Power Now, which was founded by Patrice Kalors, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, has a director of health and wellness specifically to address trauma caused by interactions with criminal justice. So in conclusion, we find that the health equity frame is being deployed by community organizations to move the needle on health concerns, to connect health issues with other issues, and to see healing and other practices not as a diversion for, from organizing, but as a key part to equipping leaders to promote broader and long-lasting structural changes. Further research is needed to develop an evidence based on the effectiveness of the health equity frame in addressing various social issues, but it could be particularly useful in grounding and encouraging a dialogue between public health practitioners and grassroots organizers working to address the health needs of highly disadvantaged groups. Thank you. So very interesting collection of papers, and I want to ask a question or a series of questions designed to sort of uh, weave a thread among them and then a couple of more targeted questions. But I'm very uh, focused with these papers on the role of language and the term equity, which, uh, which plays a different role in each of the papers. Uh, let, let me start, Rich, with you. Um, 
health in all policies is a frame, health uh, is, is a term uh, that was the organizing theme for your paper. Health equity is another term. You talked about uh, uh, political contingency. You talked about networks. Can you talk to us about the degree to which it's the health in all policies or the equity term that tends to bring people, uh, tends to uh, generate the kind of reactions that you saw in, in uh, the use of a uh, uh, health in all policies approach? Um, so I, th <coughs> I think there's a lot of variation uh, across sites. Um, the, uh, in, in some places, uh, the practitioners see health and all policies and health equity as synonymous. And you often see that in definitions of health and all policies, academic definitions. Um, on the ground, what we find is that there's more or less emphasis on health equity. So they're really engaged in a broad attempt to uh, collaborate with other agencies and then they bring equity into it selectively and strategically. Um, uh, and they do that, as I mentioned, across sites in a sort of variable kind of way because politically, you know, equity is a frame. The language of equity uh, doesn't have the kind of political purchase as it does in more liberal communities. So uh, may I want to jump over to you because you talked about equity being a helpful frame but the examples you give are equity concepts, the terms human rights, restorative justice, trauma-informed care, they don't have the word equity in them. So is it that the concept of equity is helpful as a frame or does the word, does the term help or some combination of the two? I think it's more the concept. Um, I think that health brings the, uh, a certain weight to issues that maybe were not taken as seriously or didn't have political purchase before. So it's less the specific explicit language of health equity than the concept that, you know, something like punitive school discipline negatively impacts health and well-being um, in the long term. Uh, so it's more it's more of a concept rather than the specific. Language. And then Marcia, when you look at uh, the medical legal partnerships, equity it seems is is a byproduct, clearly, because it's addressing social determinants that are unequally distributed. But I, I don't get the impression from the paper that the origins of these, the genesis uh, is addressing equity uh, or improving equity. It's just trying to meet people's needs where they are. Is, that, is it an equity frame at the, at the uh, creation of these partnerships? Uh, I think that... Um there's two ways of looking at this, and one is the very practical approach, which is what we write about in the paper, as a useful intervention. And another way is to go back to its roots, and it grew out of a civil legal aid movement where um, issues of poverty and discrimination were what was being addressed. And so it's really, um, it's, it's, it, it is, um, it morphs or uh, applies given the situations at the particular healthcare site, but at its core, it's about addressing inequities in income, uh, discriminatory practices, um, and I issues around poverty. And then, Andrew, you, you're describing basically, if you will, a, 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 an elite enterprise. I mean, it's 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 leaders coming together under the umbrella of NQF to address a. a, a a problem. So I gather in that context, health equity is a fully accepted term. It's fully accepted as a goal, at least among those who participated in this process. Uh, yes. I, I think the we did break it down into more multi-dimensional concept or, or into pieces where we talked about equity being um, collaboration and partnerships between communities and healthcare organizations, creating structures for equity, which is in actually institutionalizing equity into policies, you know, um, creating a culture of equity, making it okay to safe, have safe environments to talk about things like racism, and, um, and then also breaking it into quality and access issues related to equity. So, uh, and medical leader, legal partnerships, many other different, um, and health and all policies, these are things that fall under the framework that the committee discussed. I don't usually try to summarize uh, half an hour into the morning, but 
Um, it is striking to me across these papers, and it's why I'm so interested in them, and it's nice to have them all in a panel, that, um, I, and I think, um, Rich, you, you talked about, you know, politically contingent, that, that the language used is different in every environment that you describe, that even where the goal is equity, whether that's the right way to frame the topic, whether that's what people resonate with, whether it's what brings them together or motivates action is very different in different settings. And that some people and in some political environments, the term is, is highly motivating or variants on the term human rights are highly motivating. In other places, equity almost has to be downplayed as a goal um, and you have to build your, your political capital around a different frame, a different uh, set of goals and then have equity come out as almost a byproduct, but not sort of front and center. And it just seems to me that um, I, I don't think we've ever sort of published a, a set of papers that uh, help uh, contextualize the use of the term so much, but the, 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 the very different settings that each of you are looking at suggests the need to, for a tremendous amount of, if you will, local nuance and setting a nuance uh, with respect to, to the framing topic. And I'm, I, I'm quite appreciative of, the, of the, the way each of you come at it so differently. So I, I will follow up with a couple of, of specific questions as well, but I, I did want to get that framing out in front. Uh, Rich, let me just turn back to you. Um, again, I've, I've, I've highlighted a couple of times your use of the term politically uh, contingent. Is this about um, if you can gain traction or how to gain traction? In other words, I'm sort of back to the question of is there a way into the issue of, of using uh, uh, health in all policies in every setting or are there places where no matter how you frame it, it's just uh, not going to get you uh, uh, any traction in addressing uh, challenges around health equity? Well, I <clears throat> I think to the extent that um, public health officials are engaging with other departments then and talking about the social determinants of health, then uh, policies that emerge from that, most of them are going to reduce, address social disparities. So one doesn't necessarily need to use the language um, and uh, in order for it to be this kind of byproduct. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, that no, that's that's the that's well, no. it, mm -hmm. it, it's it's illuminating to me. I hope it is to others as well. And, and Marcia, when I asked you the last question, you very much drew on language more out of the legal side. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, as these medical legal partnerships are uh, created, does that language then resonate on the medical side, where you don't have the you know in medical school you're not steeped in the history of civil rights and, and, and the kinds of things that you might in, in, a, in a legal enterprise. So is, is this legal reaching out to medical? Or where, where, do the, where does the language and uh, motivation come, uh, bring the two together? I think on the healthcare side, uh, there are more traditional values of being able to meet the patient where the patient is and provide what the patient needs to be able to, the patient needs to fully engage in their healthcare. And the healthcare provider, the physician, the nurse, the social worker needs to have tools at their ready to be able to make it all work for that patient. And so uh, notions of equity are important in some, some organizations are very advanced in this topic, but I, I think the average organization wants tools. They want ways to help their patients and they are frustrated because they see patients coming in who don't have appropriate housing, can't their, get their kids, the kids, their kids have been kicked out of school for the fifth time in the year. Kids are getting health care, they're getting their primary care, they're not moving along, and so there's that frustration of what are we going to do about this? And MLP becomes a practical intervention. Uh, Andrew, I want to move downstream from the language. You all walk through the example of hypertension where, as you noted, there are strategies for reducing disparities. Uh, one of the things we've learned out of the quality movement is that quality improvement in one, if you have a focused quality improvement initiative on, in one area of, of health, it doesn't always spread through uh, the entire enterprise improving health in other domains. But some of the interventions you described, team-based care, 
engaging with community resources, those seem applicable across uh, health conditions. I, I wonder in the work you all did, the degree to which you see uh, the, the necessary response by the health systems and health sector as sort of a, a generic approach to equity as in teams and community resources or targeted approaches to equity specific to, for example, disparities in hypertension, disparities in cancer, disparities in uh, diabetes and the like. Um, I think one of our major findings were, you know, that they were, most of the interventions that we found applied to multiple conditions and procedures um, for reducing disparities. So you can kind of kill multiple birds with one stone. Um, there are, are also um, many other, uh, I guess, strategies that we found that were also targeted <laughs> towards just specific um, disease areas or specific populations. And we looked at a variety of social risk factors for the overarching framework. It wasn't just um, race and ethnicity, but it was also um, you know, gender and social relationships um, and also socioeconomic position. Um, but really, I think that the, the main um, takeaway is that there, we can implement these more generic um, interventions in some ways, although they will need to be, the, they will need to be tailored um, to the specific group, uh, but we can, you know, we can do more than just, you know, target one condition. Great. And May, uh, in your paper, you talk about sort of the two-directional two uh, effects, and I, I want to draw that out a little more than you did in your presentation, this notion that equity frame affects community organizing, community organizing affects the equity frame. Can you just draw that circle a little bit more for the folks here? Sure. Um, well, I, I know there's a, a large body or growing body of scholarship that um, looks at community organizing as a tool and strategy to um, impact health and health-related policies or the social determinants of health. Um, and so we kind of build on that in our paper, but we um, more explicitly wanted to think about, I guess, the how health equity um, concepts, interpretive frameworks, or ideas that are shaped by health equity um, also advance organizing, even in efforts that sort of are not publicly understood as health related and don't, haven't um, publicly been explicitly linked to health. Um, and so I, th I think we're just tr uh, trying to point out how health equity as a frame helps draw the connections between health and the social determinants of health in ways that are not always publicly uh, understood. Terrific. Uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. Uh, we have microphones, so we'd ask you to wait uh, for and identify yourself. I see one, two, and three, and uh, we'll see where we are in time after that. Yes. Bob Griss <clears throat> with the Institute of Social Medicine and Community Health. I, uh, I've never liked the term equity. It's too aspirational. I feel that the concept of civil rights has to do with leverage, that you can use and require providers to do what's necessary or other um, uh, policymakers to do what's necessary, even if it costs more money. And most of my professional work has been in this field, but within the disability sector, which is much more limited than the more generic policy issues of social determinants of health uh, that the panel is addressing. But it strikes me that we've lost the concept of, of um, taking cases to create precedents that we can then hold the whole system accountable to. For example, we use... So I'm going I'm to... Yeah. I'd like to get the panel to respond. So what I'm hearing is equity may not be enough of an action term, that civil rights has action behind it and enforcement behind it. And I, and I wonder if, again, all of you commented earlier on sort of the language side of this. It, is the equity frame sufficiently motivating for action? Or, and may, Marcia, maybe I'll start with you because you're out of the MLP world. Do you need a different frame to, uh, to, to make this more action-oriented? Uh, I, you know, Bob, I can see how, where you're coming from. For me, as a health policy researcher, I like, I like the uh, equity frame. I like that the IOM, or the, the, when they came out with their quality 
domains put equity as a quality domain. I think of it as a quality domain rather than an aspirational issue. I do think of it in a practical way. Others have a sense of? Um, I, I think I see equity as a vision um, and that you have to define the multiple goals and objectives underneath that vision statement. So yes, I'd like the term equity, but I think we have to define what it is when we're actually trying to do the work. Okay. <clears throat> Marty Wasserman, currently with Provider Resources, but formerly uh, Health Secretary for the state of Maryland. And I'd just like to echo sort of what you said, Richard. Uh, when we would be sitting with our staff, language matters, and we would be very careful. We would understand the term equity or disparities. It would be an internal, and in that sense, it would be aspirational internally. And we would use the evidence and data about our geographic area and who was the victim of a certain problem. And we would then identify solutions to those problems, bring those programs or whatever we could into those areas. And we would do that statewide, or when I served as a local health officer, we would do that within our locality. So I would draw a distinction almost between internal and external. Internal, the use of disparities, equity, health in all policies uh, is great. But externally, I, I would be very judicious and very cautious because even in the state of Maryland, it's, it's difficult to use those terms. And I would, and I would never use single payer system. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't get into that here this morning. But, um. So um, one Colorado, uh, local Colorado official uh, said, we care about equity, we just don't talk about it. And Andrew, it's, I mean, again, you, you, had a, you had a whole process built around the term, but that was sort of an internal term. Is that right? Or? Well, you know, we started out um, just at trying to tackle the issue of disparities, but then rolled it up to this larger vision of equity. And when we needed to define what that meant and how to measure it. And so that's how we got to these specific dona domains of measurement for the paper. Right here in the center, if we can get the microphone down to you. Hi, my name is Dora Hughes, and I'm with Sidley Austin. Um, and because of that, of course, my question is for Marsha. I wondered, given the success of the MLPs, if, if you've given thought to how we can scale up that type of model uh, across the uh, other states in the nation, and also if you think that the current uh, educational and training pathways for lawyers, does that support uh, large-scale implementation of the MLP um, framework. Hi, Dora. Um, we've, we're giving a lot of thought to ways to uh, spread. So right now the spread is mostly sort of hopping from healthcare organization to another healthcare organization, but doesn't spread widely throughout that organization. Uh, it doesn't do that because it's still on the fringes of healthcare, uh, because healthcare doesn't primarily pay for it. So people appreciate it, they love it, the clinicians love it, but it doesn't spread. Um, and we're working on that, and there's signs that that's changing. Hearst is very much behind this. The VA, the VA has over two dozen uh, MLPs and is trying to spread the model, especially for homeless veterans. Um, we're thinking about ways that the model can be implemented by giving guidance to the field so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel and it can be easier and easier. <laughs> Um, but until there is, I think, a real commitment on healthcare organizations to address social determinants, then MLP can come in as a really practical intervention that captures that small group of patients that can't be addressed with social workers. Um, there's, there's growing interest in this. I do see it spreading. But just like any other social determinants interventions, the evidence is limited because it's a broad intervention, it's not as well targeted, and so studies are hard to show the impact. That is slowly changing. I think we're waiting for some more evidence to have that happen. And I can't remember the second part of your question, but. Okay. Oh. Next generation lawyers. No, I don't think we're well suited for this because you have civil legal aid attorneys who are you know, quite busy on their own and they like working in a healthcare environment 
because really that's where their patients are. They're easier to track there, they're easier to find there, and it works so well to integrate on the healthcare team. But there needs to be new kinds of health professionals who are sort of highly trained social workers in legal issues or lawyers who become trained to work with patients and have a new way of thinking about who they work for. I mean, healthcare organizations hiring lawyers like Whitman Walker does, who are really patient first lawyers, not working for civil legal aid where there may be conflicts of interest at times. So yeah, we need to think, just like in social determinants of health, we need a new cadre of professionals to really address what patients and organizations need. I will note that last month our issue is our, our theme was diffusion of innovation. We had a paper on the diffusion of health leads, which is a, right. a, a model of, of, of really social uh, uh, linkages to social services. And uh, I, I think, Marcia, you, you got it just right here. I mean, there are things that can be addressed with, with lay staff or it, it, health leads began with volunteers, um, but then some things m move into requiring legal intervention and the notion of sort of these two paths starting to intertwine would, would be maybe the next generation of diffusion of that model. Okay, well, uh, please join me in thanking our first panel. Go directly into our next panel as they come and take the. Um, we do have some seats towards the front. Uh, please, if you're in the back and want to have a seat, I see a fair number of people standing. It's it's more comfortable, maybe a little less disruptive. So. We're gonna move into our second panel, which as I noted at the outset is focused on the topic of income. We have a number of papers that look at a variety of interventions and, and correlations between health, health status, and, and income, and uh, ways people use their income. Uh, equity, of course, is, and inequities occur along uh, many dimensions, but uh, with this group of papers, I think it uh, significantly improves our understanding of that relationship. Uh, you'll be hearing from Anjum Hajat, an assistant professor in the epidemiology department at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Um, Emily Cortin, a research fellow in global aging and population health at King's College London. You'll hear from Nathan Nickel, assistant professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences and research scientist at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy at the University of Manitoba and Philip Hessel, Associate Professor in the Alberto Lleras School of Government at the University of the Andes in Bogota, uh, Colombia. So I'll turn it over first to Anjum. Hi, thanks uh, for having me today. Uh, so I'm here to present our paper on behalf of our co-authors. Uh, the Lead author on this was my student, Jersey eisenberg Guyot, uh, as along with another student of mine, Cashlyn Firth, and um, our <clears throat> uh, Marika Claywater from the Evans School of Public Policy, who is an economist there. So we'll be talking today about payday loans and pawn shops, broadly speaking, the fringe banking industry uh, and impacts on health. Uh, so a little bit of background on the fringe banking industry. Um, fringe lenders, uh, such as payday lenders and pawn shops, uh, really do charge relatively high um, uh, APRs, somewhere in the ballpark of four to 600 uh, percent, if there are no regulations in place at the state level. Um, and the growth we've seen in the fringe banking industry has really accelerated starting in the 1970s or so, early 80s, uh, due to essentially deregulation of the banking industry uh, and an increased need for credit uh, by low-income folks. Uh, and this is likely related to the stagnation of wages that we've seen over the past several decades, as well as um, some pretty significant changes in the labor market. So uh, about 8% of US households have used uh, a fringe loan in the past year. Uh, this is uh, for data from the FDIC supplement on, um, on fringe banking. 
Uh, and as you can imagine, this is much more common among marginalized groups who have historically been excluded uh, from the mainstream financial services industry. So in addition to uh, folks who use fringe banking, we also have the unbanked. So these are people that uh, do not have access to a bank account um, and are also, as you can uh, imagine, quite outside the financial mainstream. Uh, again, this recent 2015 data show us about 7% of US households are unbanked. So why then did we wanna look at this in relation to health um, is, is a question to ask. So uh, first of all, to indicate what our objective here was for the, for the research, we were interested in evaluating the association between uh, service, these fringe service use and health, as well as un the unbanked and health to understand if there was a, a worse sort of health outcomes in these groups. Uh, but from a motivational perspective, there really are gaps in this existing research on debt and health. So much of this comes to us from sociological uh, research. And uh, much of that research really lumps together good and bad debt. So I'm thinking about mortgage debt as good debt, but high cost credit cards as, as bad debt. Uh, and so really this was a, uh, an attempt to really uh, disentangle that a little bit. It also really helps us expand the discussion of the ramifications of fringe service use beyond the financial impact. So there is a fair amount of research looking at um, what, what fringe banking does to uh, family finances, but very little, actually none to our knowledge, uh, research on the impacts on health. And so clearly there are two uh, potential mechanisms here that would be linking something like fringe, fringe banking to health, uh, one, of that, one of them being the stress pathway, clearly a very stressful uh, event to, to use a fringe, uh, fringe loan, which you know, has potentially many, many months of, of paying back a very high interest loan. Uh, and secondly is a material deprivation pathway where you know, people who are using these types of loan could loans could potentially be uh, facing a, a variety of insecurities around income, uh, food insecurities, housing insecurities, et cetera. And then lastly, the motivation of this work was to uh, understand the relationship between structural inequities in health, and that, that is the structural inequities in our financial services industry. So just briefly on some of the methods and the data we use. So this, all this data comes from the current population survey uh, from 2011 to 2016. Uh, as I indicated, the FDIC does a supplement uh, looking at the unbanked and fringe loans. So that's where we uh, got that data from. And then there is the March uh, supplement of the, current, of the CPS, which uh, provides limited but a little bit of health data. So our exposures here are predictors. Uh, were fringe borrowing, which we defined as uh, use of a payday loan, a uh, pawn shop or car title loan in the past year, and unbanked, which is defined as living in a household without access to a bank account. And then our outcome here was the pretty standard outcome that is used in much uh, health research, which is this self-rated health question, would you say your health is excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? And we dichotomize that to poor and, for, poor and fair health. And then in terms of analytic techniques, we used a propensity score matching approach uh, with a Poisson model to, get, to estimate prevalence ratios. We also did a slew of um, other sensitivity analysis, which I probably won't get into, but is all available in the paper. <coughs> so results. Uh, so this is just the main result from the paper uh, that, that we um, are going to share today. So as you can see here, the fringe loans, the prevalence ratio here was about 1.38. So we would interpret this as uh, those who had used fringe loans had a 38% higher prevalence of reporting poor or fair health relative to those who did not use a fringe loan. And for the unbanked, it was about 1.17, so a 17% higher prevalence of reporting poor or fair health uh, relative to those who uh, had a bank account. Um, so all of our sensitivity analysis, we looked at some control exposures, we did an instruments a variable approach, all sort of tended in the same direction. A little less precision on the estimates, but um, really were robust in terms of uh, supporting this result. So um, as I indicated previously, there really is a lot of policy implications around this type of work. So currently today in the US, only about half the states have some sort of a regulation around fringe loans. Um, so one option is an interest rate cap or a fee cap, uh, but we don't believe that uh, regulation alone is the answer uh, because as we've seen in states that have implemented regulations, uh, there are really s relatively easy ways to get around these regulations by moving online or you know, trying other sort of ways to s uh, circuit that. 
Um, so we do believe there's a sort of a multi-pronged approach. So the second um, sort of policy indication here would be uh, building alternative financial institutions for low-income folks, uh, things like the postal banking system, which existed in this country for 40 years in the uh, mid-1900s, uh, as well as municipal banking, which is uh, sort of state-owned or municipality-owned banks. Uh, and then lastly, really the core of the fringe banking issue is a problem around financial inst instability and a, a lack of resources. So thinking uh, more about what we need to do in our social safety net, our social welfare programs, uh, lots of interesting work going on too around the minimum wage and how that's impacting health. Um, so, you know, a variety of different options there. So, thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you uh, to the Health Affairs team for the invitation to be part of such an interesting panel on uh, income and health. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the findings of our paper looking at conditional cash transfers and health of low-income families in the U.S., evaluating the family rewards uh, experiment. So this is work that I conducted with a number of colleagues who I would like to acknowledge. Uh, Peter Munig, Nandita Verma, and James Richo were both at MDRC, which is the institution that uh, piloted and evaluated the broader family rewards uh, experiment. Milan Lagarde, uh, Paolo Vignes, Ichiro Kawachi, and Mauricio uh, Avendano. And this uh, specific analysis is part of the LifePass project, which was funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 uh, program. So first, a few words about the family rewards uh, demonstration uh, itself. So family reward is a conditional cash transfer. And as the name indicates, it conditions the transfer of cash to eligible families to uh, those families meeting a number of conditions. Conditions um, related, for example, to children education, school attendance, or a number of other school outcomes. The use uh, for the family of uh, preventive health care services, and specifically in the case of family rewards, uh, parental employment, gaining or sustaining uh, full-time uh, employment. So the objective of this type of program is um, to first improve immediate, uh, fin the immediate financial situation by providing those cash benefits, but also in the long run to encourage uh, human capital uh, building and potentially to break the intergenerational transmission of, uh, of poverty. So this type of program has been uh, very uh, successful and very uh, implemented in a number of countries uh, across the globe, starting in uh, Mexico with the Oportunidades uh, program. And in 2007, uh, MDRC started the first comprehensive conditional cash transfer ever implemented in a high-income country, the Family Rewards uh, demonstration in, uh, in New York City. And as part of this program, yeah, that's obvious. Um, about, oh. <laughs> All right, let me get back to my slides. Not sure what happened. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna get there. That's it. So, as part of this program, over $20 million uh, in cash transferred were um, transferred to participating uh, family who on average earn over $8,000 uh, per household over the three years of the program, so between 2007 and 2010. And a key feature of this program is that it was implemented, evaluated as a randomized controlled trial over the three-year period by MDRC. And this is really important because randomized controlled trials are very much the gold standard to try to um, evaluate whether this, tri this type of program actually uh, works, and they're pretty rare in the area of, uh, of social policy. So a few words first about the design of the intervention. So the idea of family reward was very much to target low-income uh, families in six of New York's poorest uh, neighborhood, and the eligibility criteria was a combination of family income, the age of the children, and uh, legal residency status at the time of uh, a run mode. As I just mentioned, uh, a key feature of the program was a random assignment of half of the 4,700 4, families to either 
consider a control group, which continued receiving the type of social policies that were available in New York at the time for low-income families, or to a program group, which became eligible to receiving rewards as part of the program. So we have data on those two groups at baseline at 18 months into the program, so during the program, and also at 42 months post-program. It's six months after the end of, uh, of the program. So our findings. We have findings for the primary parents for about uh, 11,000 children um, uh, in those uh, families. And we also thought a bit more about the mechanisms that could explain why family rewards, the conditional cash transfers, had an impact on health and healthcare use. So first for the primary uh, parent, um, the first finding is that being eligible to family rewards, so being in the treated group, was associated with modest overall increase in preventive care service use. So those who were in the treated group had higher levels of health insurance coverage, were more likely to have seen their primary doctor in the past year, for example, but the magnitude of the effect was very small, one to four per percent um, difference compared to the control group. The, the exception to that pattern was on dental care use. Uh, we saw much larger effect, plus 11% at 18 months, plus 13% at 42 months compared to the control group on the likelihood of having seen uh, a dentist in the, past, uh, in the past year. And this is really an important finding of the program because uh, dental care is one of the largest unmet health care needs for um, US uh, adults and the single largest among US children. Then we also saw a small positive effect of, on self-rated health at 18 months and the levels of hope at 42 months for those parents who were in the treated group compared to the control group. Small magnitude, but still an important uh, effect because very few social policy programs in high-income countries have actually managed to move the needle on self-rated health. However, all of our physical health measures, and we had a number of measures of chronic disease risk uh, measured in our survey, such as self-reported self hypertension, self-reported diabetes, and so on, remained unaffected by the program, and I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. For children, the first finding is that we have a very similar uh, effect on dental care use with a large increase both at 18 months and at 42 months, but no effect on any other health or health care measure that we had in our survey, which is a key difference between our program and Opportunidades or other programs uh, implemented in low-income countries. Finally, we tried to think a bit more about the potential mechanisms that explain why family rewards had a positive impact on self-rated health at 18 months and on the levels of hope at uh, 42 months uh, among parents. There are two possible mechanisms. The first one is that the program incentivized the use of preventive health care services, and we would expect that this would lead to better health. Or, um, the effect of the cash incentive itself. The so cash transfer reduces immediate poverty, material hardship, and financial stress, and we know that these are all uh, risk factors for poor self-rated health and poor mental health. And our exp exp uh, exploratory analysis shows that it's likely to be the second mechanism that is at play here, and I think it's a nice echo to what Adjum just, uh, just presented. So to conclude, what are the key lessons from family rewards for the health and healthcare use of low-income families in, uh, in the US? So I think the first um, aspect that we really need to keep in mind when we look at those results is that family rewards operated alongside very well-established uh, social programs in New York City, such as the Earned Income Tax Credit, Food Stamps, and Medicaid. And this is very much in contrast to uh, the Mexican um, situation, for example, where at the time of implementation of the conditional cash transfer, there was no equivalent social safety net uh, in place. Related to that as a very high level of um, compliance in a number of behaviors that were incentivized by uh, family reward at baseline. Uh, parents and children already had very high levels of um, health insurance coverage, for example, leaving very limited room uh, for additional take-up as part uh, of the program. And finally, as I mentioned, we found no effect on most of our physical health measures, and it's very likely because our measures of health were focused on chronic disease risk, which may take much longer to be affected by uh, the program and may not have been fully captured uh, within the three years um, time horizon of our evaluation. 
So the way we conclude is that in the context of New York City's operating social safety net and within our time frame, so the three-year window, condition on cash transfer led to positive but small improvement in the health and healthcare use of poor families. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Health Affairs for the invitation to speak today. Um, there we go. Uh, I'm here on behalf of my co-authors, uh, lead author uh, Marnie Brownell, um, as well as uh, Dr. Alan Katz, um, Dr. Dan Chateau, and the rest of the Paths Equity team. Um, if you're like me, uh, before I moved to Canada about uh, four years ago, I had no clue where Manitoba was. Um, and so we're located right there in the center of Canada. Um, what I also didn't know is that Manitoba and the University of Manitoba is located on the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dene, and the Dakota peoples. There were um, treaties made between sovereign nations, the United Kingdom, and these uh, First Nations peoples. And uh, the United Kingdom and subsequently Canada um, committed numerous atrocities against the First Nations and Inuit people in Canada and specifically in Manitoba. And those violations and atrocities have continued to today. Um, my team is committed to moving forward in a spirit of partnership um, working as allies and partners with the First Nations and the Inuit people um, to promote health and well-being uh, among uh, First Nations families. I moved to Manitoba partly because of the data resource that we have there. So we have uh, what's called the Manitoba Population Health Research Data Repository, and it has uh, total population data or information on every single person who lives in Manitoba. We have everyone's healthcare records, we have everyone's education records, we have everyone's justice records, social assistance records, we have um, information going back to 1971 um, in most cases, and we're able to combine this information at the individual level as well as at the family level and follow people through time to find out what's, what policies and programs are working to impact and promote health and reduce health inequities. This uh, paper is part of a large program of research called the Paths Equity Program of Research. And what we did is we looked at several programs and interventions that were designed specifically to promote the health and well-being of families. Uh, the paper that I'm talking about today is focusing on the healthy baby prenatal uh, benefit. Um, and we um, linked together information from social assistance, a variety of social services, as well as um, health care records, hospitalizations, and medical records to find out if this program was working to um, improve mater um, child health as well as reduce health inequities. A little bit about the um, Healthy Baby Benefit. It's aimed at promoting uh, pre, uh, pre and perinatal health. Uh, what it does is it, it begins in the second trimester and um, women in families who um, the family income is less than $32,000 Canadian a year are um, eligible to participate. They do need to have a, a medical doctor's note in order um, to confirm that they are in fact pregnant and that they meet the eligibility criteria. Um, we found uh, that um, roughly 60 to 70 percent of, of individuals who go on to, um, who are eligible for this program and are offered to participate end up participating in this uh, prenatal benefit. We were interested in looking at a variety of health outcomes. We looked at breastfeeding initiation, um, uh, low five-minute APGAR scores, um, low birth weight, preterm birth, small for gestational age as well as large for gestational age, whether or not uh, the um, infant had complete vaccination records at one year and two years of age. Um, and then we also looked at hospitalization within the first um, 28 days of birth as well as um, hospitalization within the first two years of birth. We um, combined a lot of the information in the repository and generated propensity scores to make our comparison groups comparable um, based on observed characteristics. And then we compared the outcomes uh, between those who received and those who did not receive the benefit. 
We found that uh, the, um, receiving this income benefit was associated with um, increased breastfeeding initiation, um, was associated with uh, decreased preterm birth, decreased small for gestational age, decreased large for gestational age, and complete vaccination rates at one and two years of age. We then went on to look at whether or not um, this benefit um, reduced uh, health inequities. What, uh, we did a simulation to say, what would Manitoba look like without the healthy baby prenatal benefit? And what would Manitoba look like if everyone who was eligible actually received the benefit? And so here we see that the breastfeeding initiation rates uh, between um, low-income um, families, so in the bottom 20% uh, of income earners, and then um, the top uh, uh, three-fifths, so um, the quintile, income quintiles three, four, and five. In those higher income quintiles, we see an initiation rate at 87.8%, and in the lowest income quintiles, it's um, under uh, 70%. This is um, if no one received the healthy baby prenatal benefit in Manitoba. If everyone received the healthy baby prenatal benefit, the breastfeeding initiation rate came up, but not by very much. Um, but this was a significant reduction in health inequities. We also looked at preterm birth. A Manitoba, again, where no one receives the healthy baby benefit. And then with the healthy baby benefit, um, the gap between low income and high income uh, families de um, is virtually eliminated. And low birth weights, again, a, a simulated Manitoba where no one receives the income benefit, and then a simulated Manitoba where everyone receives, uh, everyone who's eligible receives the benefit. Again, low term birth weight or low birth weights um, disparities were completely eliminated in that simulation. So we found that the unconditional um, income supplement uh, was associated with not only improved child health outcomes, but also with reduced um, health inequities. Now, um, as was mentioned by the first speaker, this is an observational study, so we did a variety of sensitivity tests to be able to see um, whether or not these findings were robust um, to unmeasured confounding, um, and uh, they um, were retained. Uh, there's a couple of different approaches to health equity, a universal approach that focuses on shifting everyone over to improve health amongst everyone, and then targeted interventions which serve to squish the distribution and bring marginalized populations up to look like um, higher income families. And here we have a targeted approach which shows that we can in fact reduce health inequities by addressing um, social determinants such as income. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, great to see so many uh, people interested in our paper on the effects of the Colombian social pension on health. Um, Colombia, as many other countries in Latin America, is facing very significant challenges to public health and health equity because those countries are growing old before growing rich. So for example, it took uh, the United States and my own home country, Germany, more than 100 years to double the share of the population aged 60 and above. And during this time, those countries had the benefits to grow a certain level of wealth as well as to uh, create pension and other social security systems. However, for example, Colombia, the same doubling of the population at 60 and above is occurring in less than 20 years. So it's happening in 16 years. Um, and this happens in a context of very high old age uh, poverty rates, high levels of labor informality, and a lack of access to pensions. So for example, in Colombia, the old age poverty rate stands at around 40%. More than 50% of the working age population works in uh, the informal sector, so it's not contributing to any pension scheme or anything uh, similar to this. Of all the people age 60 and above, only about 20% of individuals receive any uh, pensions. So that leaves 80% uh, cut off any uh, income uh, in uh, their old age. I should also say this is aggravated by very uh, significant drops in the fertility rates. So uh, total fertility rate in Colombia now stands at 1.9 uh, children 
by, uh, um, by per women, which also means that the traditional social support systems uh, in the form of the family are also being uh, reduced uh, ever more. As a partial response um, to those challenges, uh, one second, Understood. yes, the other one. As a partial response to those challenges, so Colombia and many other uh, countries in Latin America uh, have introduced so-called social uh, pensions. Those are uh, prim primarily uh, poverty alleviation programs providing small cash benefits, uh, unconditional cash benefits to poor older individuals. Brazil and Mexico have similar programs uh, since many years and covering a very comprehensive and large share uh, of the older uh, population. In theory or intuitively, uh, those programs should have positive effects not only uh, on poverty, but also uh, on health by uh, improving access to material conditions uh, and what we call the, the social uh, determinants of health. However, in, reali in reality, the effects on uh, health are likely more complex and contingent on, a certain, on certain factors, uh, such as access and quality to healthcare, health behaviors, and also uh, within household sharing of resources. So one paper of the very few uh, papers that exist evaluating these programs, one paper from uh, South Africa, for example, found that the program had no effects on the health of the elderly recipients. However, and only if the female household had received the pension, health of uh, children in the household improved. So again, uh, showing sort of the complexity maybe uh, of similar programs. So the aim of our paper was to uh, um, evaluate uh, the health effects of the Colombian pro social pension program called Colombia Mayor. It provides a modest uh, uh, unconditional cash benefit uh, bi-monthly uh, of between 16 to 34 uh, US dollars in purchasing power uh, parities, which is about 10% of, um, of the minimum wage uh, in Colombia, which stands at around 250 uh, US dollars. So the age cutoff is uh, eligibility ages is 54 for females and 59 uh, uh, years of age for men. Uh, which uh, note this is one of the uh, could say youngest age cut off of similar programs. Most of the other programs, uh, the eligibility age is above uh, 60. Currently, the program covers about uh, two and a half million uh, older individuals, which is around 35% uh, of uh, the population uh, age 60 and above. And the, because of the aging trends, uh, it's expected uh, that the program uh, will uh, cover around 50% of the el older population in the years uh, to come. So we use a quasi-experimental uh, design exploiting um, variations in the rollout across municipalities of the countries. And we find, looking at the effects on uh, self-rated health and hospitalization, we find that the program led to a reduction in the probability of reporting uh, bad self-reported uh, health or to be uh, having been hospitalized of around four to five um, percent. So small, uh, significant, but I think still a meaningful uh, effect um, of the program. However, uh, this uh, positive effect only existed for men. We found no positive effects uh, on uh, women or other um, health outcomes such as uh, doctor visits or uh, um, disability uh, limitations. Um, talking about or mentioning uh, policy implications, um, in my opinion, I believe that social pensions can play a very important role as part of a larger strategy of healthy aging. However, those programs are unlikely to be uh, sufficient to make a, a real effect on the living conditions of poor elderly um, individuals in uh, developing and low-income or middle-income uh, countries. However, we're also doing some uh, qualitative interviews, so you see um, that people report that those incomes, even though they're very small, have very significant effects on how they feel uh, about their, their lives. So I think it, it relates to what Emily was saying before about sort of the feeling of uh, agency, uh, having hope, having purpose, um, in life. What is really transformative for a lot of uh, re recipients is that for the first time in their life they actually receive 
a, a regular sort of income because most individuals, most of the recipients have never had a formal, a regular kind of job. So that gives them, uh, no matter how small it is, some sort of, uh, um, some sort of certainty about the income in the uh, coming months. Colombia has, uh, it's famous for having introduced universal healthcare coverage already since uh, 20 years and shown to have uh, very positive effects on the health of recipients. However, uh, poor older individuals still face uh, uh, numerous barriers in accessing those uh, services. So a co-payment still exists, uh, individuals lack uh, funds to travel uh, to the doctor, there's stigmatization, uh, discrimination, especially existing uh, for women. Uh, women also in Colombia face the double burden of uh, caretaking. caretaking. Many uh, poor uh, elderly women are still employed until their uh, 70s and thus facing a high opportunity costs of uh, uh, skipping work uh, going to uh, the doctors. So the bottom line or a question that I'm uh, thinking about is sort of how can we, uh, given that there are bu uh, strong budgetary constraints of, uh, the, of the government, uh, maximize the health benefits of such uh, pension uh, schemes, social pensions. Um, and my thinking is very much uh, to combine or thinking about how we can combine uh, supply side with uh, demand side uh, interventions, for example, by introducing uh, certain uh, conditionalities. However, um, I don't have the answer what uh, those conditionalities uh, can be. As we've seen, it, it likely is very much very com complex and contingent on a lot of uh, other factors. Uh, evaluations of conditional cash transfer programs uh, for low-income uh, families in Latin America, including uh, Colombia, have found very, very uh, complex and conflicting uh, results. Yes, there have been some improvements of uh, children's health, but it turned out uh, that uh, for the um, older family members, in many of those programs led to increases in body mass index, uh, hyper, in, hyper uh, tension likely uh, um, related to uh, a higher intake of high calorie uh, foods. So the bottom line is uh, it's probably everything uh, we do as health uh, policy makers uh, is probably contingent on a lot of factors um, and it always uh, depends. Thank you very much. I want to begin by asking the three of you who were uh, evaluating programs. Uh, the programs focus on income. You're looking at health effects. Health is not the only potential outcome associated with uh, an income-related intervention. Can you just provide a little context for the motivation of the program itself and the research enterprise, the degree to which improving health was the central goal or a peripheral goal or one of many goals and to the extent you can comment on it, uh, what you know about some of the other uh, impacts that may have been uh, found, just to, to provide a little bit of context outside of the health arena. Emily? Sure, so Family Rewards was evaluated much more broadly by, uh, by MDRC and we focus only on health and healthcare use here. So the program had three types of uh, incentives around uh, education of children, around preventive healthcare use, and around empl parental employment. So those three types of outcomes were really the incentives were also the priority in terms of uh, outcome uh, e evaluation. So the key findings beyond health and healthcare use were that uh, the program was very successful in reducing immediate financial hardship for participating uh, family. It really reduced their reliance on uh, family members, for example, for day-to-day -day expenses. It really uh, increased by definition because the cash transfer their income, and these effects were really in program, but there were still increases in self-reported financial well-being post-program. So that's a big success of the program. In terms of educational outcomes, the effects are a bit more complicated and tended to really depend on the age of the children and the level of proficiency of the, of the child when they enter the program. So the effects are a bit more complicated but tend to be overall positive as well. When it comes to employment, which was really a condition that had been added as part of family reward, and it's usually not a condition um, 
In conditional cash transfers, the effects, I would say, are even more uh, complicated. About 90% of families were able to earn a reward in the areas of education and in the areas of health, but only 50% were able to earn a reward in the area of employment. And actually, participation in family rewards increased self-reported employment, but these increases were not matched uh, with administrative uh, data. So the effect is quite complex and it's likely to be a very informal uh, type of works that have been uh, increased. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, so um, our initial evaluation of the Healthy Baby Prenatal Benefit was uh, focused on child uh, birth outcomes initially, so we uh, extended our vision just to those first two years of life. However, subsequently, we've gotten additional funding to now see whether or not um, setting up a child's health and development early on um, sets them up for education success. Um, I mentioned uh, the breadth of data we have at MCHP, at, at the center where I work. Um, amongst those, uh, when children come into school, um, there's an uh, assessment done on them call, uh, that looks at their readiness to enter school across five different domains, and we've looked at the Healthy Baby Benefits associations with those, and we're finding that um, it's associated with um, increased readiness to uh, um, socially interact with their peers once they enter school, cognitive ability, as well as language processing. So we're seeing that the ripples of this um, prenatal income benefit are, or supplement are, are extending over to early education. We're not seeing them continue up to grade three, however. So once grade three comes around, the differences between recipients and non um, become washed out. I mean, just quickly on the Colombian program or the social pensions uh, in general, there is no, let's say from judging by the legal texts, how those, uh, of those programs, there's no uh, direct intention or goal to improve uh, health. Some of them in the Colombian case mention uh, well-being, bienestar as one of the kind of uh, secondary goals or aims, but again, there's no, uh, primarily those are poverty alleviation uh, programs. So that brings me back, uh, Anjum, to your uh, sort of two pathways, uh, material deprivation and stress. Uh, Emily brought that up as well. I wonder if you could reflect on the collection here and um, how you uh, try to disentangle those two as you're thinking about the role of, of the uh, of French banking or unbanked. So the disentanglement of the two pathways is actually quite complicated, and I think we definitely, in our case, don't have the data to be able to do that. I mean, um, I've done a bunch of other stress research, and so it would be great if we could access, you know, biomarker data, some other physiological um, response data, but we don't have that. But um, and similarly with the material deprivation, again, with the observational study, um, there's limited data in the CPS to, to really tell us about uh, what what's going on there for those families. Um. Is there, I heard uh, stress, I heard hope, I heard agency, those are related but really quite different constructs. I just wonder if any of you could weigh in on, uh, from work, not necessarily what you presented here, about how those elements uh, contribute to uh, the kinds of results that you all saw. Um, so we're doing a follow-up qualitative study right now with recipients of the Healthy Baby Benefit because um, so uh, it's roughly $60 US a month, which uh, doesn't seem like very much to us um, when we're um, upper middle class or middle class individuals. However, what they said is that um, there's a couple of things that they that came out. One is that they're trusted to spend the money how they see fit. There's no strings attached to what they can use that money for. And so that um, sense of, hey, I'm a good mom, I know I can make right decisions for my baby, uh, came out during the qualitative interviews. The other um, piece was that it was just enough to alleviate that stress barrier to getting to their prenatal care. So um, we have uh, universal health care in Canada, um, but you still have to get yourself there, right? And so if you're a low income mom, you have to get onto a bus and when it's 40 below zero, it's quite challenging. So having just that little extra money a month can maybe you can take a taxi instead, or it's easier to take the bus in. Um, and so those are things that are coming out in the interviews and we're really excited about that. Mm 
-hmm. And I can sure. comment briefly. I feel like you know the research world specifically went in terms of evaluation of programs, but also looking at income broadly, is sort of moving towards this understanding that we have to start thinking about well-being and some of these more short-term outcomes. Uh, so it's not really just about hard health outcomes, but sort of expanding our definition of what health really is. There's maybe uh, just a comment about the Colombian case. So maybe even though, um, and having these discussions with uh, NGOs or other uh, platforms uh, of uh, older individuals uh, in Colombia, is it these programs maybe they're very small and they may have very small effects potentially on the individual. But I think there's a certain kind of uh, agency that are potentially great because in Colombia it's also building kind of a, a platform organizations of uh, recipients. So it's the first time what you're using this as a, as a platform also to, for the first time, uh, organize uh, themselves as uh, groups of older individuals and sort of asking, demanding improvements uh, in other uh, in other services, for example. So I think these ca they can also, uh, these programs be effective or have a, a big impact on creating a sort of a, a sort of collective agency in structuring also the dialogue of getting people involved building, uh, building platforms. So besides the individual level agency. Yeah, I think these results on, on hope, on mental health are really uh, important. And the way I'm reading it, uh, trying to extend beyond our, our intervention, is really in light of this uh, scarcity theory, which really posits that uh, poverty, in a way, it tends to reduce your time horizon as an individual to day-to-day -to -day, uh, struggles. All this stress might be why we find such negative effects uh, on health. And maybe what those conditional cash transfer do is to really lift uh, that pressure and enables you as an individual to have better visibility for planning and uh, a, a larger time uh, horizon. And um, I think what would be really interesting to do is to, we have uh, results within three years, within a, a few years of this program, it would be really interesting to see the longer term effects uh, on mental health, on hope, or any other well-being measures that are uh, available. It reminds me of someone who grew up in an era where welfare was really a negative term with negative connotations. The first time I went to Latin America and saw the word bienestar, and I thought, wow, how nice. It's well-being, and uh, how positive the connotations were uh, just listening to it in a different language. So maybe we can uh, we'll learn a bit from that. Do we have any uh, questions? We'll start over here with the microphone, please, and introduce yourself. Good afternoon, um, Dr. Sarp Axel with the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, my question's for Professor Nickel. Uh, very impressive models uh, for babies and birth outcomes. I'm wondering if there's any interest, any funding for outcomes on moms. I mean, the, in the question and answer was the first time you mentioned moms and you know getting them to their prenatal appointments. I'm wondering if there's any sort of uh, next steps uh, looking at outcomes for moms. Yeah. So. Um like I mentioned, uh, the additional funding that we have right now um, to look a little bit more into the healthy baby benefit. Um, we're expanding our look into maternal mental health outcomes. Um, right now, uh, another exciting development in Canada is the child um, tax benefit, uh, which family, um, low income families can receive. And so uh, my group is really interested in finding out whether or not that's also associated with uh, improved maternal mental health um, using medical claims data for that. But we, I don't have results yet for that. Um, the models are being run. Um, but. Yeah, it's because moms, it's a mother-infant dyad, right? You can't separate and just look at the mom or just look at the baby. They, they come together. So, yeah. Other, Dora, we'll take you again if uh, we can get a microphone to you. Um, I had two questions, if time permits. Um, the first, in terms of the level of the, of the cash benefit or the assistance, uh, do we have a sense of where the sweet spot is? Meaning, it was that level chosen be, because that's what was determined to be the most impactful, or is that just frankly the amount of money that was available to distribute among the population? I'd be curious to hear about that. And the second somewhat related question is, it sounds like we have an expanded policy audience for this type of work. And I wondered uh, maybe if Anjum, in particular, if you could comment on the receptivity or the engagement by policymakers at Department of Treasury or uh, the financial uh, philanthropic arms. I don't know a lot about that. I would love to hear more. We have time for both of those. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your, for your question. So um, the family rewards model was really um, 
design after opportunidades in, uh, in, in Mexico. So the objective in terms of the money that was invested, and it's purely privately funded, was to try to match uh, what has been done in, uh, in Mexico in relative terms. So uh, the money that was put into the program and the reward that were earned uh, by families um, were associated with about a 23% increase in uh, household income uh, over the three-year period, which is very similar to what happened in, uh, in Mexico, where it was 25 percent uh, increase. So I think that's how the program was uh, was designed. And it's it's quite high. This 23 uh, percent increase in program is uh, is quite uh, is quite is quite large. And um, so family earn on average eight thousand uh, dollars. But the top 20 percent uh, earning families earn above thirteen thousand uh, uh, dollars. So it's quite a range. And those who were like the most uh, motivated in terms of uh, earning uh, rewards ended up earning quite a lot uh, of money. So quite a big increase in, uh, in uh, household income. Any other comments on level? I mean, in the, in the Colombian case, um, so I mentioned it's the range is between 15 to 34 uh, US dollars, which is about uh, 10 to 15 percent of the, the minimum income, the monthly uh, minimum income, which is uh, again sort of the, the, the size of the social pension, very similar to uh, the conditional cash for a program to poor uh, families in Colombia. So they're sort of uh, in the same, almost in the same. Uh, a range. However, honestly, I believe it's mostly budgetary uh, constraints. I don't think anyone has sort of sit down and thought uh, what would be sort of a reasonable uh, uh, income supplement to make a real uh, difference to uh, those individuals, uh, certainly not uh, in terms of health. Yeah, um, so unfortunately, I, I would say Manitoba's experience is a little bit more towards the latter around uh, what they could politically get through government um, for such a benefit. Um, uh, it wasn't decided based on any predefined sweet spot, and it, I mean, it wasn't even rolled out as a real study like happened in New York. It was um, some uh, folks who had some socially progressive ideas and, and decided to put this in, and it got passed by Parliament, um, or the MLA, sorry, the, the Legislative Assembly. So yeah, I'm um, unfortunately I, not much better than that. Uh, so in terms of your second question around um, policymakers and philanthropists, I do know that in the philanthropy world, you know, there's a whole group of philanthropists that focus specifically on wealth and are very interested in wealth stripping activities, uh, which clearly payday loans, uh, French lend lending is one of. Um, so there's a real interest in trying to understand what the connections are with health. I've done some work with the, the Asset Funders Network, which is a group that represents um, uh, philanthropists dealing specifically with wealth. So I think that's moving to sort of in the direction where, where we would hope is bringing in the conversation around social determinants uh, amongst that group. Uh, and in terms of policymakers, um, you know, I think first it's telling that the FDIC sponsors this module in the CPS, right? So they're committed in some ways to um, understanding sort of the, the plight of the, the lower income folks in terms of banking and, and fringe loan use. Uh, but also at the local level, I think there's a lot of interest. Um, so recently in the city of Seattle, we had a mayoral election, and one of the candidates was uh, very much promoting this concept of a municipal bank. So, you know, potentially there's some room at the local and state levels to m take some action on, on some of these things. Um, I'll just add uh, on both of those questions, um, certainly in the U.S., and it came through in the, in the uh, results out of New York, because M Medicaid is essentially a universal program at the low income level. Um, the dollar value associated with it is so much larger than the cash transfer amount, it probably dominates in terms of what any marginal change in, in dollars will do. Um, and then I would just also note that we've published a significant amount of work. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank is also very interested in sort of the relationship between housing and, and uh, but, but not just uh, residential housing, the whole sort of community development side. So I think there is a, an interested audience in finance on some of these topics uh, coming at it from a, a different direction. Um, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, we have a 10-minute break, and then we'll return with uh, two more uh, excellent panels. Uh, as you're sitting down, I just want to remind you of uh, the support we received in putting together this, this issue from the Kresge Foundation, the California Endowment, the Colorado Health Foundation, the Episcopal Health Foundation, the Edna Foundation, the Robert Johnson Foundation. We're grateful to them for uh, their making this possible. 
Um, as I indicated at the outset, uh, much work has been done over the years on identifying uh, various uh, types of disparities and uh, places of disparity within the healthcare sector. Uh, we have three papers in this issue that extend uh, beyond the knowledge base in those areas that I think are important additions uh, to, our, uh, uh, to our understanding of the topic. We'll hear first from Anna Progovitz, uh, instructor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School and senior scientist at the Health Equity Research Lab in the Cambridge Health Alliance. We'll hear from Tracy Lane, a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the National Cancer Institute. Um, where she completed her PhD as part of the Yale uh, NCI Partnership Training Program in Cancer Epidemi Epidemiology. We'll hear from uh, Laura Rosella, tenure track assistant professor at the Dalla Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto in the Division of Epidemiology. I'll turn it over first to Anna. So I'm going to be talking about our analysis of um, identifying gender minority individuals in Medicare claims data, and then identifying their health and healthcare utilization. So when I say gender minorities, I'm referring to transgender and gender non-binary individuals. And I do want to start by acknowledging that as a cisgender person doing this research, I'm in a position of privilege, as are many of my co-authors. and so. We think it's very important to partner with gender minority um, community members, other researchers, and folks in the community who can really ground our work in that uh, lived experience that's so important uh, to inform the research and to inform kind of policy approaches in the future. This is a very important topic for health disparities research because um, what we know about the state of kind of health and social burden for gender minority individuals in the US uh, so far is, is pretty bad. So there are quite um, high levels of uh, worse housing, so um, lots of folks who are homeless, as well as issues of um, little employment and underemployment. And lots of these stem from issues related to discrimination, um, often that start early and actually expand into the realm of healthcare. People also report pretty high rates of abuse, um, including verbal abuse, physical and unfortunately sexual abuse um, targeted at individuals because of their gender identity. And a lot of this ends up translating to worse health outcomes, um, particularly in the areas of mental health. So there are very high rates of depression and anxiety for gender minority individuals, um, and also unfortunately, very high rates of reported suicidal ideation and suicide attempt. Um, the, the data that we have, however, tends to be mostly from targeted surveys. We uh, don't see gender identity measured in a lot of the data sets that we typically use as disparities researchers. So we, for example, don't have gender identity in many national surveys. We don't see it measured in a lot of electronic health record data, so health systems uh, don't really know how many gender minorities they have. They don't know what their health needs are in a kind of population level. And it's also not something that's recorded in Medicare claims. So our approach was actually to capitalize upon a strategy developed by researchers at Medicare where they use diagnosis codes specifically um, applied to gender minority individuals to pick up a group of people who are um, almost certainly gender minorities. We are likely not picking up other folks who don't have these diagnosis codes, but we can use this to at least start to identify and compare gender minorities within Medicare and, and see what their health and healthcare is like. So in both of the results slide that I'm gonna show, we've actually split the results by the group that's in Medicare because of age and those who are in Medicare because of disability. And um, what you can see, especially if you focus on the first two bars, uh, these are showing the rates of Medicaid eligibility, so approximate, uh, proxy for low income status, and also for having any mental health conditions. Um, and what you see is that the Medicaid eligibility and the mental health conditions are quite a bit higher in the gender minority uh, group in both cohorts. 
And for example, in the disabled gender minority group, 78% uh, of folks have uh, a mental health condition, which is actually you know, diagnosed, which is a very, very high number. And you see the same pattern in the healthcare utilization outcomes that we looked at, uh, where typically the disabled gender minorities have the highest health need and um, highest level of healthcare utilization. Um, and if you just focus on the first bar, bars on the left in the dark blue, these represent uh, the, pr the proportion of people with any outpatient mental health care in a given year. Uh, and you can see that gender minorities have anywhere from one third higher to um, almost three times higher rates of outpatient mental health care utilization. And these numbers actually adjust already for age and for the presence of mental health conditions. So even with that adjustment, we see very big uh, significant differences. The other difference I'd like to point out is the difference in emergency department utilization. So if you look at the disabled group, it's a difference of about 5%, where about 41% of gender minorities who are disabled um, have an ED visit in a given year. And in the aged cohort, the, the elderly gender minority beneficiaries are using um, or use about a third more emergency department uh, use in any given year. And those numbers are adjusted for age, for mental health, uh, mental health disorders, and also for physical health comorbidities and the number of comorbidities total. So even after quite a bit of adjustment, we're still seeing these very big differences. We, uh, as I said, found sort of the largest differences in mental health uh, need and mental health care utilization, um, as well as emergency department use. I didn't show the findings for preventive care visits. You can uh, read them in the paper if you're interested. We didn't see very big differences, but there were a few small ones. And the sort of takeaway and policy implications of this work, I think, are that first and foremost, we need better ways to actually identify gender identity in a lot of the data sets that we're using. So this means adding that um, in national surveys. It means trying to incorporate this into electronic health record systems so that we can actually identify and track these disparities. Um, and so that we have sort of a, a place to approach developing strategies for actually improving the health of this group, which has been um, more or less invisible to kind of targeted policy efforts at the national level, at state levels, um, and even at health system levels where you can kind of approach individuals, but it's been very hard to strategize kind of at the community level. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to start by um, thanking Health Affairs for the opportunity to present this work today. Um, I want to start with a quick disclaimer. Though, although I'm currently at the National Cancer Institute, I actually started this work and got involved um, as a trainee at the Yale School of Public Health. And so I'm really excited to be here to share a few findings from this work. Um, let's start with a bit of background, um, specifically where are the U.S. territories and what are some characteristics of this population? Wrong direction. And so the U.S. territories include three island nations um, in the Pacific, so American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, as well as two in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And altogether, overall, um, the territories include nearly five million members of the U.S. population who primarily identify as racial ethnic minorities. And in terms of um, socioeconomic status, the territories differ considerably from U.S. states. Uh, so for instance, um, they experience higher rates of poverty. Now, with the exception of American Samoa, individuals born in the U.S. territories are considered U.S. citizens by law. Uh, and similar to U.S. states, members in the residents of the territories contribute to things like Social Security and Medicare. However, um, federal reimbursement rates for Medicare in the territories are substantially lower than they are in the states. And while prior studies um, looking at the Medicare population have identified um, disparities in the quality of breast cancer care according to things like race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, um, very little work has, done, has been done looking at um, care in the U.S. territories and specifically looking at cancer care. And so with this background in mind, um, for this study, we were focused on the quality of breast cancer care um, in this very unique and understudied population. 
And so to do that, um, we essentially care, compared women living in the territories to those in the continental US on quality measures that are essentially defined based on recommended breast cancer care. And so specifically, we looked to see whether women in each region received um, care with things like diagnostic needle biopsy, as opposed to more um, invasive diagnostic procedures, as well as whether or not they received radiation therapy treatment following breast conserving surgery. And then among the women who received recommended care, we looked to see whether or not this care was obtained in a timely fashion. And so we focused on the time between diagnostic needle biopsy and surgical treatment for breast cancer, as well as um, the time between breast conserving surgery and postoperative radiation therapy. Um, and this was done um, using Medicare claims data, not only to identify women living in each region, but also to focus on women who were at least 66 years of age at the time of their surgery and their diagnosis. This allowed us at least one year's um, worth of claims data to look at things like comorbid conditions, but also to identify women who obtained surgical treatment for the breast cancer, specifically uh, breast conserving surgery and mastectomy in, between 2008 and 2014. And what we found is that when we simply compared women in each region, not only were a smaller proportion of women in the territories receiving recommended care, as can be seen in the first um, couple of bars here, but they're also experiencing substantial delays. And so if we look at timeliness of care, um, um, we're seeing that, for instance, at one month following diagnosis, 63% of women in the continental US had obtained um, surgical treatment for the breast cancer compared to about 42% in the US territories. And similarly for um, adjuvant radiation therapy, um, at two months following breast conserving surgery, you had about 77% of women in the continental US who obtained um, post-operative radiation therapy compared to about 41% in the territories. And these findings essentially were unchanged when we tried to control for things that could potentially influence the relationship between territory status and each of our um, recommended care outcomes. And so what I'm showing you here are the results for models that adjusted for things like age at the time of surgery and the presence of comorbid conditions. And just to orient you to this graph, um, it's anchored at one, which suggests that the, the estimate, which is the odds ratio in the 95% confidence interval, um, anchored at one suggests that there's no difference um, in the receipt and timeliness of care between the territories and women in the continental US. And so if it falls on what is uh, my left, it's worse in the territories as opposed to the other side, it's considered better in the territories. And what you can clearly see across each of the outcomes is that the territories are faring worse um, compared to women in the continental US. And so for instance, if we take one of the estimates they're looking at time to surgery, this, um, these results essentially say that um, women in the territories one month out from diagnosis have a reduced odds um, of receiving surgical treatment at one month um, following diagnosis. And so um, just to summarize, uh, our study is essentially showing us that Medicare beneficiaries, women with um, um, breast cancer in the territories, are less likely to both receive and obtain um, timely recommended breast cancer care um, compared to their counterparts in the continental US. Now this is not only um, important and concerning because uh, these findings of suboptimal care in this population could also be associated with poor survival in this population, but it's also relevant because we can't talk about these findings without putting them into context of the recent event. Um, in this area. And so um, the data from this study were collected obviously before the recent um, 27 hurricanes that devastated several areas in the Caribbean, including the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And so clearly um, findings of inequities in cancer care in the territories are, are, are obviously gonna be exacerbated in the aftermath of this, um, the hurricanes. Um, and with that, I'll close, and I wanna quickly thank uh, my co-authors and some of the seasoned investigators for allowing me to be involved in this work. So this includes um, investigators at the University of the Virgin Islands, as well as Yale, um, the senior author, Carrie Gross, um, my academic advisor at the time, Susan Main, who's now at the FDA, and um, leadership at the NCI, including my mentor, um, the leadership at the Office of Education and at the, um, office, the communications office there. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm delighted to present our, my paper on behalf of myself and our co-authors looking at the accumulation of chronic conditions at time of death in Ontario, which is the most populous province in Canada. 
Uh, before I start, I want to put the study into context. This is part of a larger study looking at population trends and improved mortality. And this work is focused on stepping back, looking at the entire population, and examining how our health system is functioning with a focus on reducing premature mortality, and also health system equity. Are the improvements we are seeing being experienced by all segments of the population? And what's really neat about the study is that we have a table of decision makers that have sat with us since the beginning of the writing of the grant and work with us throughout the project at looking at our results, telling us what questions are important, and thinking about policy options. So this study in particular is focused on multimorbidity, which is just defined as the co-occurrence of two or more chronic conditions. And you can see the list of chronic conditions that we were able to me uh, measure in this study. And we did this by uh, looking at multiple data sources and linking multiple data sources. So why is multimorbidity even important? If you think about uh, the individual here with four chronic conditions and ask any physician, this will be a very typical patient. And in fact, most individuals, especially towards the end of life, uh, struggle with managing multiple chronic conditions. And this is a challenge for them. It's difficult enough to man manage one, never mind three, four, or five. Uh, but it's also a challenge for our health system, which is focused mostly on specialist care. Uh, the individuals may be interacting with multiple specialists. And of course, this increases healthcare resources. We know that those with multimorbidity are the highest resource users of the healthcare system. And it's been difficult to date, although the evidence is now evolving, in sort of our understanding about multimorbidity. We've been quite good at documenting the epidemiology of specific conditions, and less so about multimorbidity. So to give you a sense, we, in the study, we have every death that's ever happened in our province since 1990, and these data are linked to a variety of databases similar to what Professor Nickel talked about earlier. We have demographic information, socioeconomic data, every healthcare interaction, including every physician and hospitalization visit, as well as disease-specific registries, and data that's encoded in the death certificate, including cause of death. All these are individually linked, uh, linked, and in this study, we looked at 1.6 million adult deaths over almost two decades. So what did we find? The highlights of our findings are that multimorbidity is increasing in a significant way. In our early study period, we saw uh, the, the prevalence of having five or more chronic conditions by the time they died at about 39%, and this raised up to 65% in 15 years. So that means about two in three individuals are dying with five or more chronic conditions. It's very significant and very common. When looking at this across the socioeconomic spectrum, we see that there are definite patterns. Initially, we were unclear how this would manifest. We know from our other work that individuals at low socioeconomic status tend to die more prematurely, which means they may accumulate less chronic conditions. But actually, what we found is when we looked at the group that was increasing the most, the five or more chronic conditions, the prevalence was higher in the lowest income categories, about 7% higher and a 4% absolute difference. And of course, one of the challenges of studying multimorbidity is that there's a lot of things happening. Most conditions are increasing. There are some conditions which decreased over time. These are cardiovascular conditions. Um, but we saw the biggest increase for hypertension, arthritis, uh, mood disorders, and other mental health conditions. And this last graph, graph just summarizes what that looks like from the socioeconomic perspective. The figures on the right. Uh, will show where there's a higher proportion of these conditions in low-income groups. And what we see is almost all conditions are more represented in low-income areas, uh, aside from cancer, which we see a higher prevalence in high-income areas. And in particular, the top two conditions, COPD, diabetes, are they're very large differences. What's notable about these conditions is that they are preventable. So what are the policy implications of this work? We've really just scratched the surface assembling this database and refining the methodology to measure multimorbidity at the population level. But one thing is certain, the accumulation of multiple conditions is the typical trajectory, uh, not a sort of one-off situation. And this requires a health system that recognizes that patients will more likely die with many chronic conditions than not. And this is a system that should be oriented towards multimorbidity management versus specialized care, which is currently how the system is structured. 
Secondly, the nature and type of multimorbidity varies according to socioeconomic status. We see this overall, and we see this for specific conditions. Where we have been mean, making gains at the population level, we see gaps. They're not experienced by all. And we see increases for the most preventable conditions, uh, more represented in low socioeconomic groups. And then finally, given the high burden of multimorbidity and chronic disease, prevention must be a priority. Not only management, which was taken care of in the first point, but a, a strong focus on how we prevent these chronic conditions in the first place, and as well taking into account uh, health equity. And those, of course, are signatures of a population health approach, which a health system should embrace to better uh, attend to both multimorbidity and health equity. Thank you. slides. There we go. Um, I want to begin with what is maybe a little bit too easy a setup, but I want you to take it where you want to go. Uh, what's striking in all three of these papers is that they're all analyzing populations with universal health coverage. You've got two that are looking at people with Medicare and one looking at Canada, which we we heard earlier today has universal health care. Um, and yet we have these uh, significant disparities. If you think about the early research and discussion around equity in the United States, as I mentioned, often called disparities, epitomized perhaps in the Institute of Medicine's uh, <clears throat> report, unequal treatment, the focus was very much on the treatment side, sort of within healthcare system disparities. And yet, uh, now much of the discussion is around uh, social disadvantage, social determinants. I wonder if each of you could reflect, as uh, Laura, you did a little bit this at the end, um, reflect on, given the work you're doing, given the data you are analyzing, uh, the degree to which you either the data speak to or other work you're doing speaks to the relative roles of the broader uh, social context and the potential for social disadvantage to be driving the disparities you observed uh, relative to what you might think of as inside the healthcare system, disparities, unequal treatment, um, unequal access, uh, even in a universal payment uh, scheme. Anna? Sure. Um, so there, I think there's two issues going on with gender minority individuals, um, at least two. But uh, if you just take the first question about coverage, so um, the, what Medicare is covering for gender minority individuals um, typically doesn't include a lot of what people would consider gender affirming care. So up until 2014, there was actually no coverage for um, gender affirmation surgery or sex reassignment surgery, for example. And even when that decision was reversed, um, the, the decisions were individual and um, regional. So there are lots of um, lawsuits out there for people trying to get coverage. Um, and and this, um, these surgeries are considered kind of the standard of care. So I think that's one issue that complicates it. The, um, the other issue, I think, which maybe for um, especially the folks who don't necessarily want to transition but are just trying to get kind of the, the care that the rest of us are getting, uh, there's lots of reports of discrimination and um, also I think lots of um, ignorance around what is appropriate when treating gender minority individuals. So um, something like 50% uh, of transgender individuals say they have to actually educate their providers about the care that's appropriate to them. And um, there are you know, lots of instances of people going into um, a setting where they're not being addressed um, by the proper pronouns or the proper names. Sometimes that's actually very uh, scary and dangerous for people in um, like a waiting room setting because it could expose them to other discrimination, even potentially other people in the waiting room. It's kind of outing them in a way that they don't want to be outed. So uh, I think it, it can't stop at just coverage, uh, particularly for this group. And there's a, we have a long way to go on um, training issues. Great. Tracy. Yeah, um, in terms of the, the population in the territories, I think what's interesting when you think about sort of a, a shared source of care, here you have this population uh, with quote unquote access to Medicare, but obviously federal differences in federal funding um, um, 
certainly inform differences in the way that care is received by that population. And I also think it's interesting that up until this point, a lot of the disparities that we've identified within the Medicare population by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status are certainly are essentially captured in this unique population that is uh, home to mostly racial and ethnic minorities and who have lower socioeconomic status. And so I think it's sort of this complicated um, combination of both um, uh, variations in, in, in the level of care, even though it's a similar access, and um, a population that identifies with characteristics that have long been documented or associated with disparities in the quality of care. I think what we are all showing in all our studies are the social determinants of health. And we uh, absolutely, everybody deserves and needs access to care when they're sick, but we can't expect the healthcare system to address the social determinants of health. It requires a much more holistic approach, and we need to integrate with social systems, uh, how our environment is built. So that's obviously much more complex. Obviously, access to care is essential, and uh, I would say a, a minimum. Um, but I think the reason why we continue to see these uh, pers persistent trends is because we're not tackling social determinants of health in a way that brings in the social system. So let me just uh, take a slightly different angle it, it, it's related to the prior, but it has to do with the chronology in addition to the social determinants, which is, can occur at any time in life. <clears throat> For example, Medicare is a universal program when you, uh, when you hit 65, although uh, in the first paper you uh, separate between those eligible due to disability and age. Um, the Canadian universality doesn't begin at 65, but uh, as you mentioned, the accumulation of of uh, disadvantage occurs through uh, the social sector and social and people's social experience over the course of their life. So I just wonder again if the three of you could reflect on the uh, chronological precedence associated with the disparities that you're reporting on. To what degree do we know about the existence of of uh, uh, barriers to social uh, care or or medical care? for those you're studying prior to when they obtain uh, the universal coverage of Medicare? To what extent do we know about the distribution of social supports in, in uh, Ontario prior to people uh, that were the focus of your study? Sure, I'd say that we know for gender minority individuals that uh, social and health burdens start very young so um, some of the highest rates of reported suicide, depression, anxiety appear to be kind of in young adult populations. But um, experiences of bullying, of discrimination, uh, those are happening even in children. And lots of times when people uh, come out to their family members, this is a time when they start to experience kind of loss of social support, potentially homelessness. There's actually a lot of transgender and gender non-binary um, youth who are homeless and, um, and then end up turning to sex work. And that's why you see a lot of um, other uh, issues with health and, and obviously well-being and physical danger. So um, I certainly, it, it's for sure true that the disparities are starting far before people reach 65. Um, and then uh, to what extent can the health system kind of solve that gap right away? Um, not sure, but it's, uh, it's an issue that providers should know about so that when they see somebody, they kind of have this in the back of their head as they're treating them. Um, and in terms of the territories, um, while there's limited um, national data or inclusion of the population in national data, we know that certainly before um, becoming eligible for Medicare, um, there are health inequities in terms of things like diabetes, they tend to have higher rates compared to um, the US states are certainly playing out, um, and in terms of things like asthma rates, um, certainly there are healthcare disparities playing out early in this population. Um, I think we know a lot, although I will say that uh, certainly with the policymakers I work with, um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't keep reminding and measuring these things, because I think we've been fairly thin on the action side. And I think we heard earlier about the need for tools um, enable, in order to enable action. Um, from my perspective, um, the reason why we don't know as much as we could on the social circumstances are simply because the data aren't collected to, 
together. So typically a healthcare interaction would only include health information. And uh, in our setting, we've been able to piece together pieces of information to build that picture. But until that's more integrated into the healthcare interaction, it's going to be very difficult to action it. Uh, questions? We'll take uh, two right here, one in the back, and then we'll see where we are on time. Maybe just to very quickly um, so reiterate what has been said about universal healthcare coverage. So Colombia introduced universal healthcare coverage uh, covering 40% uh, of the population that didn't have any coverage in the mid-90s and scaled this up to almost 100%. So there's a very nice uh, pre-post policy evaluation uh, design opportunity and colleagues of mine have published on this. What happened is it has not reduced uh, disparities in mortality or any other uh, uh, sort of measurable health outcomes on the population level, um, which is very sad, but uh, also, if you look at, uh, you also have to look at, the, let's say, the distribution of, uh, and that paper uh, by Laura was very nice on this, the distribution of health uh, conditions. So, for example, Colombia, the highest causes of death are external causes, uh, accidents, as well as non communicable diseases, uh, which, on the other hand, are very uh, difficult to treat by uh, uh, any, uh, uh, any healthcare system. So, um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Right behind you. Hi, uh, Kathy Madsen, Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine. And I support a health services research program at Uniformed Services University that is also looking at another universally insured population, which is our military health system. Um, for those that don't know very briefly, this does not, um, this includes both active duty and non-active duty people. So people's, uh, spouses, children, retirees, et cetera. It's, it's not just the people who are still in uniform. And therefore, it's a very nationally representative population. And over the last couple of years, we have put out a body of disparities research, mostly looking at uh, racial and ethnic disparities um, within a universally insured system. And what we found overall is that when the care is provided directly by the physicians employed by the DOD, we tend to see a mitigation of disparities across the board. When care is outsourced to the civilian sector, even though it's still universal access, universally you know, insured, we see the same kind of disparities that you all are seeing. Um, we have not dug deeply into the transgender issue. Uh, we, we hope to be able to. Um, it's certainly a very fascinating area, but um, just wanted to point out the difference in the two data sets. Thank you. Uh, right here in the back. I'm Sonia Clay with the American Academy of Family Physicians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have a question about the breast cancer study. Um, I'm just curious whether or not there will be some type of follow-up in terms of outcomes. Um, and I say that because um, not to suggest that more testing, well, we're living now in a world of outcome-based care and evaluating whether or not um, quality of care is tied more to outcomes versus testing. So I'm really kind of curious about that because increasingly, and especially in the area of, say, cancer screening, um, sometimes fewer tests end up resulting in better outcomes. That, but we're now also within the world of Medicare, and we're moving away from a fee-for-service world and into a more outcome-based world. So I'm really just kind of curious about that and just kind of curious about how we're defining quality care, whether it's based on just procedures versus outcomes. I know that was kind of convoluted, but I apologize. No, thank you for that question, and it's obviously relevant. So for the study, the quality of care was determined or defined based on recommended um, care in terms of um, diagnosing breast cancer, and then um, tr subsequent treatment. And so we looked at, um, again, diagnostic needle biopsy, receipt of um, post-operative therapy. Um, but in this particular study, we didn't look at, uh, for instance, survival. And, and certainly in the paper, we allude to that the next step, one of the next steps uh, for this analysis is to look to see whether or not these differential um, um, differential receipt of, of quality recommended care is tied to outcomes such as like five-year survival for breast cancer in this population compared to um, their counterparts in the continental U.S. 
And so it's something that we're thinking about, but certainly this, step, this study was a first step and assessing um, what quality, just based on receiving care, rec diagnosing and treating breast cancer in this population looked at, looked like. Yes. Here, here, uh, here comes the microphone. I'm Esteban Rivas, I'm a family medicine resident at Unity Healthcare. So my question was for Ana. I was, because uh, you had mentioned about physicians not having, um, or not knowing enough about treating um, transgender and gender nonconformant patients. I was wondering what recommendations do you have for, um, I guess, for residency programs and for, I guess, pediatricians and family medicine that would be treating these patients? Yeah, so I know at Cambridge Health Alliance, um, where, I, where I work, there's a big demand from residents and trainees for, for more training in this area, um, and that a lot of the um, physicians who are training and, and mentoring just haven't had this background. So I, I think it should start even in medical school, and then um, there are actually lots of, um, I mean, obviously they should they should include this in training programs as much as possible, but I know the kind of contact hours that people get in LGBTQ-related training overall is, is pretty narrow, and so that when you split down to transgender and non-binary folks, it's even less. So I'd say there's also a lot of um, resources out there for um, people to access. So um, WPATH is one um, international group that puts out kind of clinical recommendations for um, transgender individuals and how to treat them. And then um, there's a place in Boston called Fenway Health. They also put out a lot of, um, they have training programs that they, can, they, they do um, kind of locally, and then they have a lot of information online. Um, and I don't know as much about kind of regulatory-wise what would need to change to get the uh, trainings into residency programs, but I think it's definitely um, something that people are asking for, and I, I think that's a good sign. Hopefully programs will catch up. Last question right here. In terms of the breast cancer study, uh, Mike Curry with United Healthcare. In terms of the breast cancer study, it, it, interesting results. Is there any qualitative information on what led to those results? Is it provider access? Is it clinical competency? Is it patient follow up? Anything? So, good questions. And, um good next steps, um, but it was not the focus of this particular study. Uh, and certainly, um, the co-authors involved in the study have been leading um, research in this area, not only um, on evaluating care in the, in the territories, but looking at quality measures and pinpointing uh, barriers to care. And so, um, part of their next steps uh, for the larger project is to look at and connect um, things related to what you identified to um, these outcomes that could be driving these differences. Um, as we close this panel, I will just mention we had a Narrative Matters piece uh, last, late last year, uh, first person narrative of a, a transgender, uh, with a transgender author describing the experience in, in the healthcare system and, and just pointing to some of this in a more of a first person basis. So since there's been a lot of interest on the topic, I thought I'd make sure you all were of the, aware of that as well. Um, please uh, join me in, <laughs> me in thanking our panel. <laughs> We're going to move directly to our final panelists, who I'd ask to come up. Um, we have a number of, of programs that and, and pieces that are looking at uh, efforts to uh, in, to reduce disparities and um, some very interesting results from those, and they'll be the focus of our final discussion here. As they're getting settled in, uh, you'll be hearing from John McConnell, Assistant Professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Oregon Health Sciences University, Michael Cohen, Doctoral Candidate in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Yale School of Public Health, Glenn Flores, Chief Research Officer and Director of the Health Services Research Institute at Connecticut Children's Medical Center and Professor of Pediatrics and Associate Chair of Research at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, and Mike Pesco, health economist and assistant professor at Georgia State University. I'll turn it over first uh, to John. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate the uh, chance to present this research to the audience and uh, to, um, to publish this work alongside the other great articles in health affairs and also uh, all the help from the staff and editors at Health Affairs. 
Uh, this is a, a paper about Medicaid, and Medicaid is undergoing some of the largest transformations that it's experienced since its inception more than 50 years ago. Uh, if you looked at the headlines of the newspapers today, a lot of the focus would be on work requirements and things like that. But it's important to remember that there are a variety of other states that are focused on delivery system transformation and changing the experience uh, that their patients and beneficiaries have. Oregon is a state that is uh, in that line of work, and uh, its big Medicaid transformation happened in 2012 when it moved most of its Medicaid population, 90% of its Medicaid population, into coordinated care organizations, or CCOs. CCOs can be thought of as a type of Medicaid ACO or accountable care organization. They're accountable for the cost, quality, and access of their beneficiaries. We published some results of this uh, about a year ago in Health Affairs. Um, what's interesting, and the reason I'm standing in front of you here, is that, that in addition to some of the standard benchmarks for ACOs or CCOs, the legislation that created CCOs uh, made health equity and eliminating health disparities a key target for CCOs. So this was written into the legislation. And um, the Oregon Health Authority was charged with uh, reaching out to underserved populations to understand their needs, uh, with uh, putting into place best practices around culturally appropriate services, with implementing those policies and programs, and with reporting back on the progress of these, uh, this, these steps to the governor and the Oregon Health Policy Board. Uh, so, um, so this is sort of a kind of a, what I think of as a good example of a state using its Medicaid uh, lever as a way to address disparities. And I think Medicaid is an interesting tool for addressing disparities, both because it uh, covers a population that is often underserved and, and disproportionately covers a large group of uh, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, but also because states generally have a lot of flexibility in how they set priorities and carry out Medicaid programs, and so uh, they can make this a priority. So. Uh, what did Oregon do? So it did three things, or at least I'll focus on three things. They did a lot. So the first thing they did was that each CCO was required to have transformation plans um, and write out what they were going to do. Not all of this addressed equity, but some of it had to address equity. Um, and so this is kind of a commitment to action. Okay, we're going to start doing something, and you can imagine, I think of this when I work with my kids. What are you going to do? Write it out and tell me and show me how that's going to work. So this is sort of a start there. Uh, the CCOs were encouraged to adopt uh, these uh, class standards. These are culturally and linguistically appropriate service standards. That's a 15 uh, set of 15 action items that provide kind of a roadmap for organizations that are, are supposed to address uh, health equities or that want to address health equities. CCOs also started to review their own data, and this is kind of a first step, an easy thing to do, to stratify data by race and ethnicity and see where there are gaps and gives you some points of, of action. Oops. Um, CCOs also, or, uh, what, another thing that the state did was they created regional health equity coalitions, and these were intended to serve as a bridge between CCOs and the community. You could think of CCOs as being a little bit like MCOs, or sort of maybe removed, maybe in fancy office buildings, where regional health equity coalitions were down in the community, understood the needs of the community, but had links to the CCOs, and so they could uh, advocate for, uh, for representation on the board, advocate for issues of health equity to be part of the board agenda when the board met. Uh, and the third thing that the state did was uh, they uh, certified and trained a large group of community health workers. Their target was 300. They trained more than 570 community health workers. These are people who are trusted members of the community. Um, they're out there. They have some understanding of how to make links between not just uh, individuals and in the health system, but also individuals and in all their social service systems. Uh, Oregon did a lot of work on figuring out how to pay, whether it was through Medicaid claims or through uh, grants, uh, what it looked like. It was kind of easy to put these into clinic settings and pay them there, but they did some work to think about what happens if we put them in community-based organizations, which is where community health workers kind of want to be and, and make links there, and so some of that was the work there. So these are three strategies that the state uh, used. I'd ask you to look at those and see that most of these are within reach of most states, so this is not necessarily rocket science, but just making a concerted effort to try to address uh, uh, health disparities through your Medicaid program. So our study here is, uh, is relatively simple. We took uh, Medicaid claims data and we looked at trends. We looked at, or sorry, first we started out and we looked at where do we see disparities in the Medicaid claims data. And we saw big disparities in white, black measures of access and some measures of quality, ca quality of care, and also in, um, in differences between American Indian and Alaska Native uh, measures and, and uh, uh, white beneficiaries. And then we looked at changes going from uh, before the CCO intervention, uh, past uh, the, the intervention, and then looking in years 2013 and 2014 to see if those gaps shifted. Claims are a pretty blunt measure, but it's also something that CCOs were using. They were looking at those claims to see where there were changes. So this is kind of a, a useful uh, uh, tool to see if we saw changes after uh, the CCO intervention. 
And so what we did see were some changes, promising changes in some areas, and these were most prevalent in areas of access. So we saw uh, gaps in primary care utilization uh, uh, shrink, so in the, in the uh, black-white gaps, those sh uh, shrunk from a, a difference of about 12% to about 8%, um, and almost disappeared in the gap between uh, white and American Indian beneficiaries. We saw similar changes in other quality measures around access, so preventive care measures and things like that, the gap there tended to shrink. We did not see any changes in um, the difference in emergency department utilization and preventive, uh, uh, preventable hospitalizations, although those, uh, those were coming down and trending in the right direction, but no statistically significant difference. So some uh, kind of hopefully early promising results, mostly around access. Um, we, saw, we also saw some challenges, or at least some issues, that the state would have to confront going forward. So a variety of groups were assessing this and, and trying to understand what was happening. And one concern was that there was no systemic attempt to address disparities. CCOs kind of do this on a grassroots level, and that's helpful in some contexts because they understand the local context, but also they're perhaps missing some of the benefits of standardization. Oregon also had a lot of uh, success uh, early on with some pay for performance measures, and so they started down the road of trying to figure out how do we pay to improve equity and ran into some uh, roadblocks right away. The first was that uh, issues of size, and some of the CCOs are small. If you take a small population and you restrict it for a quality measure, it gets smaller, and then if you try and stratify by race, it gets even smaller, and so they were worried about power issues there. And the second was that, that uh, doing pay for performance for quality is a little bit easier because you have a benchmark you're trying to hit. If a disparity is, is defined as a gap, then that can sort of shift in different ways. And so they weren't quite sure how to uh, incentivize around a gap. So one way you can close a gap is by having access or quality uh, decrease for white beneficiaries, if that's the benchmark. Or it could be the case that, that everybody's quality is going up, but the gap isn't changing. And how do you address that? So that was a challenge. Um, this is something that Oregon is trying to work on in their CCO 2.0 venture, which should launch in about nine months. So this is a target of active conversation. But uh, nonetheless, we think that this is sort of an interesting model of one state that said disparities are a priority. Here's what we're going to do, and this is what it looks like so far. So thank you. Thank you. I wanted to, to thank Health Affairs for having me here today to speak about this work, and my co-author, William Shapiro, who is another PhD candidate at the Yale School of Public Health. So today, I'm going to be telling you about our work, which essentially asks, what is the effect of household immigration status on Medicaid enrollment? And by household immigration status, the way we conceptualize it is having at least one undocumented person in your household. So we were kind of motivated to do this work because of prior research, which tries to look at this link between uptake of public benefits and immigration policy environments or local immigration enforcement. And in particular, a lot of this prior work has looked at how the children of non-citizen parents were less likely to enroll in Medicaid than children of citizen parents. Uh, we wanted to look at um, kind of a similar idea, but in the context of the ACA Medicaid expansions and in adults and thinking about uh, whether people in a mixed status household were less likely to enroll in Medicaid. We hypothesized that these individuals in these mixed status households would be, might have concerns about applying for Medicaid because of, uh, you know, worries that this information might be shared and uh, expose the undocumented person in their household to immigration, immigration enforcement or other types of scrutiny. Uh, so we, Essentially, uh, to do this, we have to figure out who is undocumented in a household to create this indicator. And this has traditionally been quite difficult in publicly available survey data. Um, you know, as you may know, many publicly available surveys do not ask individuals if they are undocumented. What we do is we uh, adopt an, an approach from George Borjas and create individual level identifiers in the American Community Survey. Um, this, he has used this approach in, in some of his work, and we take the 2009 to 2015 American Community Survey and adopt it for our work. And essentially this approach is a residual approach which first takes your entire sample, discards the individuals who are citizens, and then asks a series of sequential questions to kind of whittle it down until you're left with a group of individuals who are likely to be undocumented. 
As you can see here, we first plotted the percentages of people with Medicaid coverage by state Medicaid expansion and household immigration status. Uh, what you can take away from here, the top two lines are for expansion states, so those states that expanded Medicaid. And you can see that throughout the pre-period that the rates of enrollment among individuals in mixed and non-mixed status households are actually fairly similar throughout the entire time period. However, the bottom two lines are for which are for states that did not expand Medicaid. You can see throughout that pre-period that individuals who were otherwise eligible but living in mixed status households were significantly less likely to be enrolled in Medicaid. What we were really interested in here is what happened when states expanded Medicaid and how did these differences between individuals in mixed and non-mixed status households change. So in our first model, we essentially use a triple differences estimator where we're comparing individuals in mixed and non-mixed status households pre and post AC, uh, ACA Medicaid expansion and using uh, non-expansion states as a control group. So within uh, states that expanded Medicaid, we find no statistically significant difference in the rate of uptake of Medicaid between individuals and in mixed and non-mixed status households. However, in our second model, which is when we look just within states that did not expand Medicaid, we do find a difference. We find that the change in, in enrollment was about 1.65 percentage points less in 2014 for individuals in mixed status households relative to those in non-mixed status households, and that this uh, difference increased in 2015 to 3.05 percentage points. We also did do an analysis where we looked just among a subset of individuals who were lawfully present immigrants with the idea that these individuals might be more susceptible to feeling uncomfortable enrolling in um, Medicaid because of living in a mixed status household. And while the magnitudes of these effects were larger, because of limited sample sizes, the confidence intervals get quite large and none of our estimates reach uh, typical measures of statistical significance. I just wanna highlight a few limitations. One, again, about the, the fact that we imputed for undocumented immigration status, and this is likely imperfect. Uh, you know, there's probably some misclassification, but when we estimate the overall population using our method and compare it to estimates used by the Pew Research Center or the Department of Homeland Security, they're quite similar. And we also, in our second model, you know, lack a natural control group, and we control for a number of um, covariates, but it's possible that we, we could not control for everything. So to just summarize the main results, these results suggest that uh, household immigration status may have dampened the woodwork effect in which ACA improved knowledge about Medicaid availability and increased enrollment in the program even in non-expansion states. Uh, but in expansion states, we actually find that enrollment was statistically indistinguishable between the two household types. We, in our paper, tried to go into you know, what may explain some of these differences, and we lack the data and have not yet been able to go through the process of figuring out exactly what they are, but it could be reflect uh, information availability that differs across states, state enrollment efforts that some states, particularly those that expanded Medicaid, might just be better at getting people enrolled who are eligible, or immigration enforcement, which goes back to some of the earlier work that um, has been done on this topic in the past. You know, we should care about this because of the link that shows that having insurance is important to getting care at the right time in the right place and ultimately improving health outcomes. So this depressed uptake of Medicaid could worsen disparities in health outcomes. So going forward to reduce these differences may require just being more explicit about the fact that this information collected during the application process won't be shared with authorities for immigration enforcement. And while the Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency did release a memo in 2013 stating this, it might not be salient to individuals or they might just not even trust it. Uh, there could be uh, investment in bilingual material assisters material and assisters, as well as trusted community organizations. And finally, you know, we should probably continue to monitor this going forward, given that our data is through 2015 and the you know, conversation and immigration policy environment has certainly changed in the last several years. Thank you.
Thank you and good morning. I'd like to start by thanking my co-authors and NICHD for funding this research. So Latinos are the largest racial and ethnic group of children in America, comprising one in four US kids. That's over 18 million. But it's been true for decades, they continue to be the most uninsured racial and ethnic group of US children, with 8% uninsured versus 4% of whites. Despite this long-standing disparity, not enough is known about what interventions are most effective for ensuring Latino kids. Our study aim, therefore, was to conduct a randomized controlled trial of the effect of parent mentors, which I'll refer to as PMs, on ensuring uninsured Latino kids. Whoops, somebody auto-timed me. And this trial is called the Kids Help Trial, Kids Health Insurance by Educating Lots of Parents, and that uh, acronym my teen daughter came up with. <laughs> <laughs> so the methods are as follows. Uninsured Medicaid and CHIP-eligible Latino children were recruited from seven Dallas community sites with the highest proportions of uninsured and low-income Latino children and randomized to PMs or the control group. Subjects in both groups were contacted monthly by blinded research assistants to monitor outcomes for one year, and additional participants were followed for up to two years after the trial ceased. PMs were bilingual Latino parents in a primary care clinic who already had Medicaid and CHIP-covered children. They underwent a two-day training session addressing the types of insurance programs, the application process, completing and submitting applications with the parents, being a family liaison and advocate with the Medicaid and CHIP programs, renewing coverage, obtaining pediatric care, and helping families with food, clothing, and other social determinants. PMs met with families in their homes and at community sites and contacted them regularly via phone, emails, and texting, and controls received Texas's traditional Medicaid and CHIP outreach and enrollment. And the results were as follows. A significantly higher proportion of PM groups obtained health insurance versus the control group at 95% versus 69%. And the PM group had a significantly higher adjusted relative risk of insurance coverage at 1.4. Sorry about the auto time there. This, uh, what we also see here is an adjusted propensity curve. So your y-axis is the percent insured, x-axis time to insurance. Your PM group is the top bar, control group the bottom bar. And what you see here is a market difference between the two groups in obtaining insurance that emerged within the first few days and was sustained throughout the one-year follow-up period. In terms of time to coverage, renewal rates, and long-term coverage, you can see that the median number of days to obtaining insurance was 151, so over five months for the controls, only about two months for the, the PM group. In terms of renewing insurance, it was 65 versus 89%. The two-year coverage rate, so that's one year after the intervention ceased, was 72% in the controls, 92% in the PM group, and the three-year coverage rate, 70 versus 100% coverage in the PM group. In terms of access to care, you can see that controls after a year of follow-up, 41% had no primary care provider. That compares with 15% of the PM group. No usual source of preventive care, nine versus 1%, and different sources for sick and preventive care, 25 versus 11%. In terms of unmet needs for medical care, you can see that the control group didn't receive all needed health care overall at 29% versus the PM group 15%. Preventive care, it was 30 versus 7%. Acute care, 33% versus none. And specialty care, 57% versus none. In terms of out-of-pocket cost of care and family financial burden, you can see controls had a mean out-of-pocket cost for preventive care of $50 versus $9 for the PM group. It was $55 versus $12 for sick visits, $120 versus $3 for the ED visits, and the child's health caused financial problems for the family reported by 16% of control parents and 5% in the PM group. <clears throat> in terms of satisfaction with coverage and the uh, care quality, you can see that parents were very satisfied or satisfied with the coverage process. 65% of controls, it was 85% for PMs. The doctor never sometimes takes time to understand the child's specific needs, 31% versus 15%. The doctor never sometimes respects your, the expert on the child, 28 versus 11%. The parents mean quality score, this is for the child's well child care visit, scale of zero to 10, 10 is the best, 8.6 versus 9.2, and the parents mean quality score for specialty care, 60.9 versus 9.7, almost perfect. 
In terms of cost and cost effectiveness, the mean cost of the PM intervention per child per year was a little over $636, but the PM intervention saved $698 per child insured per year. In terms of the impact of PMs on coverage disparities for Latino children, the PM intervention completely eliminated disparities in coverage rates for Latino children. During the five-year study period, the intervention reduced the uninsurance rate from 100% to 5% for Latino children, and that's lower than the 6% uninsurance rate for white children nationally during the same period, and well below the 12% uninsurance rate for white children in Texas during the same period. In conclusion, PMs are significantly more effective than traditional Medicaid and CHIP outreach and enrollment in ensuring Latino children obtain the insurance faster, renewing coverage, teaching parents to maintain children's coverage up to two years after intervention cessation, improving access to medical care, reducing out-of-pocket costs and family financial burden, and achieving parental satisfaction and quality of care, and PMs eliminated coverage disparities for Latino children. Policy implications include PMs improve Latino children's health care, reduce families' financial stress, create jobs in vulnerable communities, and might save money, all important national and state policy priorities. And based on these findings, the federal CHIP reauthorization legislation that was signed into law in January makes organizations that use PMs eligible to receive $120 million in grants for CHIP outreach and enrollment. So all 50 states and DC now have the opportunity to apply for CMS funds to implement successful, evidence-based, Kids Help PM model. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Michael Pesco from Georgia State University. I'd like to thank Health Affairs for organizing this panel. I'd like to thank my co-authors, including Benjamin Cook, who's here in the audience. And I'd, I'd like to acknowledge funding from the American Cancer Society. So I'm gonna talk about tobacco uh, use surcharges in the small employer marketplace. By small employers, uh, we're talking about employers that hire less than uh, 50 employees in most states, although a few states um, uh, count uh, employers that uh, hire less than 100 as a small employer. And by tobacco use surcharges, we're talking about the ability of these employers to charge uh, tobacco users more for health insurance premiums than uh, non-tobacco users. Now, the rationale for um, allowing employers to do this is that tobacco users in the private uh, insurance marketplace use uh, more health care resources. And so potentially, rather than asking non-tobacco users to subsidize higher health care costs for tobacco users, it makes sense to differentiate premiums so that tobacco users are paying more uh, for health insurance since they use it uh, more. Now, tobacco use surcharges aren't a new thing. These predate the Affordable Care Act. However, there were some uh, key changes in the use of tobacco use surcharges in the small employer marketplace that came about as a result of the, um, the Affordable Care Act. One of the most significant is that um, uh, health status is no longer allowed as an acceptable rating criteria for uh, health insurance. Um, and so previously, uh, tobacco use surcharges, even if they were allowed, they may not have been very important for employers to use since they could set premiums based on health status of employees uh, directly. And so by eliminating the ability of uh, employers to differentiate premiums for healthy and sick uh, employees, potentially that uh, makes tobacco use surcharges uh, a remaining uh, rating criteria a, a more important criteria. Uh, however, there are some restrictions in terms of what the Affordable Care Act um, allows. Uh, the Affordable Care Act allows employers to use tobacco surcharges, but they must accompany it with a wellness program that provides smoking cessation services. The best of these programs, they uh, provide a group and individual counseling, and they provide nicotine replacement therapy for the uh, employees. And the surcharge can be levied as long as the employee does not participate in one of these programs. The Affordable Care Act also allows states to eliminate or reduce tobacco rating. The ACA set a cap of 50% that uh, employees can be charged for um, as a tobacco surcharge. Um, however, some states have opted to uh, lower that. Four states and seven states, including the District of Columbia here, have eliminated that 
altogether. So in our, our study, a uh, fairly simple uh, descriptive uh, study, we used a nationally representative data source provided by the Kaiser Family Foundation that uh, surveys um, the health insurance offerings of employers nationally. Uh, we identified the small employers within this data source, and we found that approximately 16% of those employers, those small employers, use tobacco use surcharges. Uh, based on the industry composition of these small employers and tobacco use prevalence of those industries, we estimate that approximately 365,000 uh, employees nationally uh, use tobacco working for one of these small employers and so are affected by the tobacco use surcharges. Uh, however, we uncover some evidence of noncompliance with the spirit of the ACA, primarily that employers that use tobacco use surcharges must accompany that with a workplace wellness program providing smoking cessation services. Uh, approximately half, 47% of small employers using surcharges did not offer a tobacco cessation wellness program, according to our data. And additionally, so this would be 47% of the, um, of the, of the 16% of small employers did not offer the wellness program. Uh, additionally, of those 16% of small employers using tobacco use surcharges, 14% of those uh, use surcharges in states that technically don't allow them. So there is a s quite significant evidence of noncompliance with ACA uh, regulation. So we, doc we documented that uh, there's disproportionate noncompliance within certain industries, uh, in particular the service industry and the blue collar industry. Um, as well as employers that hire a disproportionate share of older employees. Um, and so this could contribute to, uh, uh, this could exacerbate disparities uh, by uh, charging tobacco users more, particularly within these industries, without providing them with access to resources to quit smoking uh, through the workplace wellness uh, program. And so um, our research team, we recommend that the spirit of the ACA be followed more uh, thoroughly by um, enforcing uh, the, that health insurance plans within the small employer marketplace be accompanied by, by wellness program to provide tobacco users uh, working in, these, um, in this marketplace with access to resources to quit. Thanks. I have a couple of specific questions to get us uh, going. Uh, John, you alluded to the fact that uh, you published with us previously uh, some of the broader effects of the CCO approach in Oregon. Um, you also mentioned when you were describing the challenges to uh, pay for performance approach, uh, the, that uh, um, among the other things you described was that there are ways to reduce disparities like bringing down levels for the the uh, advantaged population, which aren't really what you would want as your goal, uh, even though it would reduce disparities. I wonder if you could just put the findings you present today in the context of the broader findings regarding overall effect. So you show reduction in disparities, uh, talk a little bit about how that actually plays out in terms of uh, overall levels of improvement. Uh, well, so the, are you talking about kind of the broader, uh, so, so overall what, the, what we found is the, that the CCO model appears to be working pretty well. It's, uh, it's reduced spending by about 7% relative to a comparison state of uh, Washington, which it, during the time didn't have any other major policies. Um, quality has, uh, was sort of, I think, uh, mixed, but in areas where they did pay for performance things, the CCOs responded pretty powerfully. And access uh, has sort of been flat or maybe a little bit down from relative to, to Washington, actually still higher in terms of baseline levels, but, but dipped a little bit, which um, may be because Oregon had such a, a large Medicaid expansion. But overall, I think the state has seen this as a um, generally moving in the right direction and sort of trying to figure out how do they uh, continue this momentum and make uh, further changes with a lot of emphasis on health equity. The governor released a, a, a letter um, uh, just a couple months ago about what they should prioritize on, and she had four things, and health equity was one of those. So. so just as a general proposition, the reduction in disparities is in the context of general improvement. It's not, a re it's not an improvement. It's not a reduction in disparities because the levels are going down for the advantaged population. And, yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure everyone here uh, was uh, clear on that. Uh, Michael, I, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting study, and I'm, I'm struck by the pre-data in addition to the change data that are presented and described. Um, I realize it's probably not statistically significant, but you actually have 
higher levels of uptake in mixed status families in expansion states yeah. prior to the expansion. Um, I, I just wondered, again, how sort of the pre-data affect your thinking about what the dynamics are. Yeah, that is a really interesting point that um, I think deserves more looking into. I think a lot of it is just what we, what we think is important is that the policy environment really matters. And, you know, we did a little bit of digging and we find using, for example, this immigrant climate index, which is used by, or created by researchers at Baylor University, which kind of compiles all state laws and regulations and creates a numerical score for each state kind of on how their immigrant climate is, is that non-expansion states just tend to be, uh, you know, have less restrictive laws, kind of don't add more enforcement in addition to federal regulations, don't put more barriers up for immigrants in accessing public services, and that maybe a lot of this just explains kind of the environment in which people live in, or at least how they perceive it. And um, that might explain that people, in, you know, just the policy environment really dictates how people, how comfortable people feel accessing this benefit. Uh, Glenn, two, two questions. Uh, the first has to do with uh, the slide where you talk about the savings due to the intervention. It's a relatively low cost intervention, generating savings. Just wondering if you could say a little more to folks here who have not had a chance to read the paper about what those, uh, how those savings are, are calculated. Sure, so in terms of the savings, we're looking at the rates of hospitalizations and ED visits in both groups. We're also looking at the uh, costs of missed work days for the parents, and um, we factor that in and then did an, an interval cost effectiveness ratio to come to that figure. Um, the the, sus the uh, sustained results are really striking. We have you know lots and lots of interventions out there with short-term uh, results. Here you've got these sustained uh, uh, improvements in coverage. Loosely speaking, I'd say there's sort of two uh, mechanisms that you could imagine, and maybe you'll think of one that I'm not thinking of. One is uh, that it's sort of an empowerment relationship knowledge awareness uh, pathway, that, uh, that the intervention gives people an understanding that this is a benefit that they're eligible for. If they lose their coverage, they kind of know where to ask, and they, they come to expect it and, and, and therefore sustain coverage. The other is more of a health system uh, pathway, which is, uh, you know, it's like why Jim, uh, why why uh, gyms want you to go use the gym when you pay for the membership because by using it you you see the value in it and you you're still willing to pay your monthly fee. So this would be sort of because gaining coverage increases utilization. Uh, utilization gives the the uh, parent an understanding of the value, but it also gives the health system a reason to check on people's insurance status every time they come in and to help them renew if they uh, if something goes wrong and they lose coverage. Any sense of how much of this is sort of a, as I say, a sort of knowledge awareness networking as opposed to sort of an inside health care system dynamic that's going on that, that leads to these, or again, maybe I missed a a completely different possibility. Yeah, I think the crucial word that you use is empowerment. So this empowers parents to help themselves and their children. So they're being helped by parents from their community who are interested in helping other families. And what did they do? Well, they helped them to learn not only about coverage and how you renew it, which is a, a tall order these days, unfortunately, but also about health care literacy. So we emphasized having a primary care home, a dental home, some people didn't know about having a regular pharmacy, and so that was very empowering. Um, but in addition, we addressed social determinants of health. So we talked about things like, what do you do when you don't have enough money to cover rent? And what about housing issues? And what about food insufficiency? And I think that combination was what really sustained things. And by empowering them, that's why you see two years after the intervention ceased, there was still 100% coverage in the intervention group. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Michael, you, you um, set out to look at, at the tobacco surcharges and the programs. Uh, in, in the end, I think it's because of the data source, you're able to talk about disparities by industry. Um, a lot of the focus here, of course, has been on income, race, and ethnicity. I gather that's not directly measurable here, but can, is, is that a dimension that <clears throat> there are any data that could, could guide us, or are we really sort of stuck at the level of, of industry sector because of uh, where the data come from? 
Uh, yeah, we, we were interested in trying to look at race and ethnicity, and, and we were really underpowered to uh, to do that by trying to, uh, we, we know the industries that people work in, and we we know, you know, roughly the uh, racial and ethnic composition of these industries, but we, we really couldn't say much about that. Um, so, you know, I think there is a lot of uh, interest right now in blue-collar workers, service workers, uh, especially, and in, in that's about the level that we can get at with disparities. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions. I see one, two, and three, and uh, we'll take those and then see who else is in the queue. My question is for Glenn. We've seen lots of uh, examples of interventions and programs, and the challenge is scaling it up outside of the local application, and it looks like you've been able to do that, or your team, and I'm wondering if you could comment on how we, you got the success out of its local um, initial point to uh, wide adoption throughout other states and other areas? Yeah, I think the key is coming up with a model that works, that empowers the communities. I mean, if you think about it, we eliminated disparities, we improved health outcomes, we improved parent satisfaction, um, we reduced costs, and we created jobs. And I think that's appealing to states, and that's appealing federally. And we've done it now across different conditions. Not only have we done this with the uninsured, we did it with asthma and minority kids and found that it reduced ED visit, reduced symptoms, and actually saved about $600 per kid per year. And um, we've done this in other settings. People keep talking about universal care. At one point, we did a study in Massachusetts when they actually provided insurance to undocumented kids, albeit a limited plan, but we also found that in this case, community health workers were much more effective than sort of the traditional passive outreach enrollment that the state was employing. So I think the key to scalability is making sure that it empowers the communities, but also appeals to policymakers and to health systems. Um, right here. Hey, um, John, you talked about moving to the 2.0 model. So it's kind of a two-part question. How did you leverage and utilize your managed care organizations or your health insurance payers in the current model, and how are you planning to better leverage them in a 2.0 model? Uh, well, so, uh, and I guess I should say, it's, you know, uh, if, if you're asking me how did, how did I do it, I'm, I'm just a, a, a witness and not, a, not an activator. But the state, so what the state had before was they had a fairly deep managed care penetration. Uh, when they formed the CCOs, they had to, uh, the CCOs had to do th new things that MCOs didn't have to do before. So, for example, they had to uh, contract or bring in a uh, uh, mental health care organization, and same with dental, dental care. So they wanted to integrate all of that. So, they, so the, they, they sort of started with an MCO platform in some cases. In some cases, there wasn't MCOs, and so the CCOs were started by a physician group or hospital group or something like that. But they, they leveraged the existing infrastructure, um, and, but were required to do new types of things. And so they, they had to do those new two types of things to get the contract. Um, the CCO 2.0, um, I think, uh, let me see if I can bring it to, to memory, but it's sort of, um, it's pushed on these things that I would say started, but but there's more progress to be made. So health equity is one of those, and I think they're still trying to figure out exactly what that means and where those pressure points are going to be. Um, Value-based payments uh, is another one, and so you know I think that what we saw was that that was something that was under the CCO global budget, but there's a gap between kind of um, theory and practice. We all think that Medicaid agencies can do value-based payments, but sort of getting them in place is a little bit trickier than we thought. Um, there, uh, um, I think there's a lot around social determinants of health, uh, and then there's one more that I'm, I'm blanking on in front of an audience here. So, um, but I think it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of identifying high priorities and figuring out what the levers are and how to, to move that forward. And I think the context here is they sort of finished their five-year waiver. Um, they were ready to, to kind of go forward, and it's, what they did is they hit the pause button. They said, we want to get this right, and so we're sort of taking the next 12 months to figure out what the contracting can be and how do we sort of write these contracts so that these things aren't just sort of there in name, but there's actual uh, levers, incentives, uh, other types of things to make them happen. Um, hello, so I have a comment and a question. So I said my comment is as a a uh, son of Mexican immigrants who grew up on Medicaid, I really appreciate your work. And um, my question is for Glenn, is the, I was wondering if you guys looked into uh, the primary language spoken at home and um, it's see the, the participants, if they use that primary language and how that impacted, I guess, their, um, what am I trying to say, the, um, how <laughs> their, I lost the word that I'm looking for, is the, <laughs> sorry. 
It's all right. It's all right. We have enough, yeah, to, so work. One, we have enough to work with here. Yeah. <laughs> you bring up a great point, because right now there are 65 million people in the United States who speak a language other than English at home, and 26 million who are limited English proficient. And so one of the most important things in this study was that the parent mentors were bilingual. They were, were Latina. They were from the same communities. So not only were they able to bridge any language gaps, but when there were cultural issues, they were able to address them as well. And that's why I think this is such a powerful intervention, whether you're talking Latinos or Asian Pacific Islanders or American Indian, Alaska Native, or African American. <clears throat> this is something that you can apply whether there are cultural issues or linguistic issues. And um, thank you for being so successful coming from your humble roots. Yes, right here. Hi, my name is David from Unidos US, formerly the National Council of La Raza. Um, and Michael and Glenn, both um, really encouraging findings um, that you found. And I guess this question is kind of for both of you. Um, first, Glenn, you, you found that the, your, your model was able to reduce completely disparities impacting Latino kids in Dallas and in, in Texas. Um, obviously, a red state, conservative policies, but also has a history of large Latino populations and maybe Republican Party is more responsive to the, the community's needs versus another red state. But I'm wondering if, um, you know, your findings kind of back up what we kind of know intrinsically, culturally competent outreach and care is very important. But do you think that that's kind of to reach to the level of parity that Michael found within mixed status families, do you think, is that enough to kind of bridge the gap that these communities are facing in terms of fear? Um, and, and we've seen recent you know, slow in uh, take up rates of SNAP and other programs decreasing significantly among the mixed status population. Are, the, are these types of interventions, do you think enough to kind of bridge that fear or, or what do we need to, how, do, how can we expand on that to address this very complicated environment. I'm going to take a stab first. So I'm glad you brought up Texas because we felt like if we could do this in Texas, we could do it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> because seriously, because I was there for eight years and uh, they unfortunately led the country in having the highest uninsured rates and of course, highest Latino uninsured rates. So we figured if we could do it there, it would be successful. And I think it was precisely because we were empowering the community. I actually worked with small businesses where we did the re recruitment too and I think that really lent a lot of legitimacy to it. So that study was focused on those who are Medicaid and CHIP eligible because unfortunately, it's anywhere from two thirds to three quarters of all uninsured kids in the United States are eligible for those two programs, but they're not enrolled and we know there are lots of barriers. So in that study, we were trying to overcome that issue. In our earlier study in Massachusetts, there were undocumented kids and families and one of the biggest issues we had to overcome was, first of all, awareness about the programs and then second of all, that this won't affect their um, documentation status and it won't affect them being deported. And so I think, again, the fact that we had the community health workers from their communities and they also were Latino went a long way in making sure that the families trusted us and felt empowered by the program. Uh, I think I'm glad that Glenn answered that question for, mm -hmm. first. I think he's a little bit more qualified to talk about this since he was a, more on the ground and I'm kind of taking a uh, outsider's perspective from uh, you know higher up, I guess. I would say that you know it, it was encouraging what we found in the expansion states in terms of the parity, uh, but again, we need to kind of monitor this going forward. I think you know a lot of the things that have been proven to be helpful in the past are you know culturally competent outreach workers. Um, making sure that information is available to people that they understand how to enroll and whether or not they're qualified. Um, and just perhaps continuing to emphasize the relationship between information collected during the enrollment period and how that will or will not be shared with other government agencies because given the anecdotal evidence that I hear, that is a, is a major concern and so it just doesn't seem to be understood or, or trusted and so I think that might be a good place of focus going forward. 
Well, it's nice for us to be able to end on a panel that's uh, able to show some real uh, successes, and I appreciate the tenor and content of the questions. Um, this is an area, as I said at the outset, where much has been done to document disparities and to be able to move the discussion more to addressing them is really encouraging. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking our last panel. And I'll just close with reminding you of the uh, support we received to do this issue and event from uh, the Kresge Foundation, the California Endowment, Colorado Health Foundation, the Episcopal Health Foundation, the Aetna Foundation, the Robert Johnson Foundation. Uh, we'll see you in May for our thematic issue on precision medicine. And uh, until then, we are adjourned. Thank you for your participation.